But thank you guys for taking time out of your day to be with us. And um, this is fun. And those who miss it, just remind them they can go watch it on the, or any ones that you might have missed because we've done this is our fifth one. You can go to the progressive uh, YouTube channel. So go to YouTube and type in progressive orthodontics and you can find all these case studies. This is the fifth one. And there's also some cool videos on there of uh, when we had Don in the studio. What's it been now? It was probably in May, I think, Don. So it's been maybe uh, four months or so. We had a nice recording session talking about uh, progressive aligners and talking about uh, other exciting products that are going to be coming out soon. The um, progressive meta ortho simulations. And it was a good recording session. So there's some videos in there to call the what do we call it? Progressive Aligner Talk, I think is what the series is called. You can go click on some of those and Miles, our CEO and Don and myself are sitting around talking about fun topics. So your YouTube channel's got a lot of, of fun things to look at. All right, guys. Well, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome. Super glad to have you guys all here. Um, again, my name is Collins Harrell. Uh, I am the I guess, head instructor here at Progressive Orthodontic Seminars and uh, excited to be working with Don McGann, who, as many of you know, is um, doing consulting and mentoring and has been working on developing orthodontic simulations with Medit for the last, what's it been, Don, four or five years and um, learning aligners through his VIPs. And uh, so these cases, these case presentations that we are teaching on are uh, cases that his um, doctors that he does consulting and mentoring with um, have provided. And so this particular case that we're going to look at today um, was mentored by Dr. McGann, along with Dr. Amit Lala. And uh, I think Don does the diagnosis and treatment planning and all the communication. And then when there's a setup, uh, Amit will go in and use his skills to kind of master the setup and um, and so together, they're a good team. Uh, so I'm grateful for Don in providing this uh, presentation, putting together this slideshow. And uh, we are very grateful to Dr. Lucy Galletly, who practices in Queensland, Australia, who was his VIP doctor um, that he was mentoring this case for. We'll talk more about her as we get going. But thank you to all these people who've made this possible. And I'm grateful for the opportunity to go through this case. You guys are going to like this. It's a great one. So um, hopefully those of you who are in the US have had an opportunity to try a progressive aligner case. Um, the launch of progressive aligners is what has prompted us to do these case presentations to help you get excited about and learn more about using aligners by looking at some case studies together. Um, those of you who are in Europe or Australia or other parts of the world, um, those are coming very soon. We're hoping by the end of uh, October. So. Um, stay tuned, and those should be showing up soon. But those of you here in the U.S., we've been having a lot of great feedback. Um, people really, really like the product. And, you know, we knew going into this that Miles uh, had selected the very best uh, manufacturing partner. And so the company that's manufacturing these aligners for us is just really, really good. And, you know, particularly what everybody likes, not only is it a great product, but the designers behind the stage, the people who are actually doing the setups, so that's really what makes an aligner great is the skill, talent, education level of the people behind the scenes who are doing these setups, who are reading our instructions and interpreting them, who are looking at the data and um, at the, the records and coming up with a really well-staged, well-set-up treatment plan so that it's, pre it's predictable for you, the general dentist, because that's what we want. And so... Um, and then we have given specific protocols that you know for work for the general dentist that we have our own designers there at Progressive Aligners uh, with our manufacturer. So they're able to give you great setups. So um, if you haven't tried one yet because it's not available where you are, get excited about it. If you are here in the US uh, and you haven't tried a case, please reach out. I'd love to help you get started if you need help getting started. So we're gonna go through um, some concepts before the case. We're gonna talk about you know, this case highlights a suspected functional shift, which, you know, we will see in the case that this was something that was present that was corrected. Um, so we'll talk about what that means before we start looking at the case. We're going to go through some routine, uh, a routine for checking 3D setups that Don has developed. 
And uh, when we get to that point, I'll have you take some photos maybe because it's a great little six step thing that you might want to have in front of you when you go and evaluate your setups. And we'll touch just briefly on some finishing aligner concepts, the finishing aligner product. Um, Don taught a webinar case presentation on that two weeks ago. And um, so I'll refer you to that when we get to that point. So let's jump in and talk about what is a functional shift what are we talking about? What are we looking for here? And um, how does it play into this case? So whenever we see upper and lower dental midlines not aligned, the first thing I do when I'm looking at a case is try to decide why. Okay, so that's the first thing that sets that kind of triggers me to look for something is when I see the upper and lower dental midline really out of alignment with each other. And there's a lot of different reasons why they may be out of alignment with each other. Okay, um, it could be that there's asymmetry in one or both of the arches. So <clears throat> the, the teeth within the arch are shifted around to one side. So maybe the upper one is shifted around to one side because maybe they lost a baby tooth early. And so everything slid over that direction. Maybe there's a tooth that's blocked out. So things are slid over that direction. Maybe they're missing a tooth on that side. Um, you could have a symmetry in the dental arch in the lower. So the lower teeth could be shifted around. You could have that in both arches. You could have skeletal asymmetry, meaning the, the shape of the mandible or the shape of the maxilla or the way it's you know, connected to the base of the skull is skewed or not on straight, you know, for this patient. And so that could cause a midline discrepancy. Um, okay, so those are the things that I'm thinking, like, I have to be an investigator and figure out why are these midlines not lining up? Okay, the next thing that I look at is, let me grab my, my pen here so we can draw on this. So if I can tell that the upper midline is actually pretty well centered with the face, you know, so you look at the patient and you go, well, the nose, the overall face, the lips, everything seems to be lining up pretty well with the upper midline. Then we start to suspect that maybe the reason why the lower midline and the upper midline are not lining up is because there may be a functional shift of the mandible, which means that the way that their teeth have come together, um, there's something in their bite, there's some kind of a um, premature contact, some kind of a um, traumatic occlusion, something, some kind of an occlusal interference. And so they shift their jaw to the left or to the right. And they have been doing that ever since the teeth have been erupting or whatever was causing that shift um, so that everything kind of fits together. Their bite, their maximum intercuspation fits together when their mandible is shifted, which means that it's rotating around one axis. So one side is getting pulled out relative to the other side. So you'll have one condyle that's seated ideally, or maybe even pushed a little bit back into the fossa. And then on the other side, it's pulled out. Okay. So if you have a upper midline center with the face, but the lower midline is off to one side, then we start thinking, oh, maybe there's a functional shift of the mandible here. Okay. So then we're going to look at the dental arch and we're going to look for, which we have a picture of in a minute. We start looking, hey, it, are the arches symmetrical? within the arch, are the teeth set up symmetrically within the arch form, or is it asymmetrical? Because that could be why, why they're off. It may not be a shift. But the other thing we look at is the class on the right versus the left. And if we're off by four millimeters or more, chances are, again, good that you may have a functional shift present. This could also be due to asymmetry. So it's, it's all of these things adding up together that can indicate to us a functional shift. Okay, so we see lower midline is off, upper midline is centered with the face, the arches look symmetrical within themselves, which we'll look at in a second, and then we look at the classification on the right side and the left side, and we might have class one occlusion on the right side, and four or five millimeters class two on the left, and you go, okay, obviously things are off, and again, it's either due to dental asymmetry, so within the arch, the teeth are shifted around, or you may have skeletal asymmetry. So the bones are not symmetrical left and right. So it functions irregularly, or you could have this functional shift. Okay, so what else do we look for? We look at the overjet on the right side versus the left. So if you look at the canine and the overjet of the canine on one side versus the other side, Sometimes it's pretty obvious to tell that the overjet is more severe. You have more overjet 
on the side opposite of the shift. So if we suspect that the patient is shifting to their left, we would have excess overjet on the right because the mandible is shifting away from that. And then you would see an insufficient amount of overjet on the side that it's shifting towards. So on the left side, sometimes it'll even be a crossbite. So sometimes you'll even see that there's a crossbite on the left side. Okay. So this is a functional shift of the mandible. And then even when you look at their face, sometimes you can tell that the that the chin is deviated off to one side. And when they talk, they even talk like a pirate. They kind of talk out of the side of their mouth because they've learned to shift their jaw and function over there. Well, that seems to be more the adults who have you know had that for a long time, that they tend to talk out of the side of their mouth. So we're looking at midlines. We're looking at classification differentiation, right versus left. We're looking at the Horizontal overjet at the canine and the bicuspid. Sometimes you can see it all the way through to the molars, right versus left. And the facial symmetry, does the chin look deviated off? Is the TMJ uh, disturbed on one side? You know, are they having symptoms? Because if you're pulling the mandible and shifting it around, you can have, it can be jammed on one side in the back of the uh, joint, or it could be pulled out on the other side and could cause some problems. Okay, and so if we're seeing these things, then we can suspect that there's a functional shift. How can we actually confirm that there's a functional shift? Well, you can take a frontal a frontal Ceph, okay, where we can actually trace everything and we can confirm that the lower teeth are centered within the bone, but the whole entire mandible is shifted off to the side that we suspected there to be a shift. And or you can put a splint in the patient's mouth that disarticulates the teeth so now the maximum intercuspation of the teeth no longer is dictating the position of the mandible. We put a splint, a flat plane splint in the mouth for, you know, three to four weeks. We disarticulate the occlusion. And if we see when they come back in that now the midlines, if we say, okay, you know, you've had your splint in, let's pull it out and just gently close until something touches and hold that. And we see that the midlines are lining up better. Then again, that has shown us that, hey, when we basically get rid of the teeth, the mandible wants to shift back to center, okay? Because it was shifting off to one side. So then we start to look at what would be the uh, the cause of the shift, okay? It may be that we have a transverse deficiency in the upper arch. Maybe the upper arch is a little bit narrow and needs to be expanded. And so they're shifting their jaw off to one side to avoid a uh, cusp to cusp collision and that their teeth actually interdigitate better when they're in a full crossbite on one side and not in crossbite on the other side. Um, it could be an anterior crossbite, some kind of a collision. Some patients not only will function to the left or to the right, but they'll actually also have a forward functional shift. If it's a class three case, you'll see a forward functional shift where they are holding their jaw forward and possibly to the left or to the right. Okay, so anterior crossbites, posterior crossbites, We'll show some pictures of this in a minute. Lower, second, molar, mesial, inclined. Um, so the inclined planes in the back, the way the teeth interdigitate, can have collisions. And they're they're shifting their mandible to basically get rid of a cusp-to-cusp -cusp collision and find a spot where their teeth interdigitate better than the way that their jaw wants to function, you know, where it's in um, centric uh, relation. So... Could be a buckle crossbite, like a scissor bite. You could have one bicuspid that's come in really far to the buckle or really far to the lingual so that you have that scissor or telescopic crossbite and that's causing the functional shift. It could even be the torque of the anterior teeth, um, you know, really retroclined anterior teeth that's causing them to have to hold their jaw back and off to the side to be able to get it together. Um, the torque of the posterior teeth, you can have the lower molars that are tipped too far to the buckle or too far to the lingual. And it's hard to know whether did the teeth erupt that way because they were shifting or did they shift because the teeth erupted that way? doesn't really matter, but we need to figure out, you know, where it's coming from to help us know what we need to do to be able to treat the case. So this case is interesting because the patient does have a functional shift and we'll look at the records together when we get there and kind of see what are the, what did we notice that made us suspect a functional shift? Okay. And then how did Don instruct the aligner company to set up the case in order to allow the shift to be corrected and avoid kind of a disastrous outcome by misdiagnosing the case. So it's a, it's a fun one to look at. So here's a couple more pictures just to reinforce what I've just explained. 
Over here, we have models traced in DentalCAD within SmileStream. Okay, when we trace models accurately, we can see when we compare where the mesial point of the molars are in relation to the arch form, and this is from this case that we're going to look at, we can see that those line up pretty symmetrically. Okay, so we don't really have asymmetry in the upper arch. If there was asymmetry in the upper arch, we would see the upper molar somewhere advanced, maybe on one side like this. And so the lines would look like one line is up here and the other line is down here. And you go, okay, there's a significant difference between the left and the right side. And that could be what's accounting for the, the fact that the midlines don't line up or the fact that the classification is off on one side versus the other. Okay. Because maybe again, they lost a primary tooth early. They lost a, an upper second primary molar. So the upper first molar erupted more mesially. And so everything's off. Okay. But that's not the case here. Here, everything looks symmetrical in the upper arch and the upper midline was aligned with a face. We'll see in the records in a minute. And same thing in the lower arch. If we put the arch form on correctly and we trace the model correctly, we end up seeing that there's not asymmetry in the lower arch. The lower arch looks pretty symmetrical. So when you have two symmetrical arches, but you have class one on one side and four or five millimeters of class two on the other side, or maybe you've got a couple millimeters of class three on one side and a couple millimeters of class two on the other side, and you've got symmetrical arches, then you have to assume and investigate whether the mandible is shifting, okay? Whether they're, when they're in maximum intercuspation or centric occlusion, the way the teeth want to fit together is causing the mandible to shift, to pull on one side and rotate around the axis of the other one. I'm all set up again. So functional shift. All right. So we have investigated and if we have determined that there's a good causation for a functional shift, we want to kind of identify what those might be because with aligners, if we can go and remove some of those before we actually take the records, before we take the scan, we might actually be able to get them closer to where we want them to end up without the shift. We can get rid of some of the shift by doing some occlusal adjusting before we take our scan and send it off to the aligner company. Okay, so we want to, if we can, identify possible, possible occlusal interferences. What is the patient avoiding you know, what would be uncomfortable for them to bite on that's causing them to want to shift their jaw? And on an interoral scan, here's a interoral scan being viewed in the Meta software. Um, you can look on the lingual and you can look on the buckle and look for distal inclined planes, occluding on the class two side with the, you know, the side towards which it's shifting occluding with mesial incline planes on the lower. So upper distal with lower mesial. So here you have distal, distal, there's in there is a distal one. And these you can see from the lingual side, but all of these distals are occluding with the mesials of the lower. And so things are fitting together better when the patient shifts the mandible around to the left side. So if it wasn't being shifted, you'd have a bunch of like traumatic occlusion. It would be like biting on the on your incisal edges on the front teeth. And that's not comfortable. So the patient shifts to try to find a place where all of these things interdigitate better than if they were to just bite straight up and down in centric relation where the jaw wants to be. OK, so this kind of locks them in to the class two bite on the one side because everything fits together together better in that position. So what can you do before you take the scan? OK, you get out your articulating paper and you look for what are these inclined planes or these tip cusp tips that are causing this shift. And sometimes if you really look at the distal buckle. Um, cusp of the lower second molar, sometimes that tooth is tipped where it's got a lot of mesial tip and that distal buccal cusp is sticking up in a way that they just can't bite down without shifting it backwards to be able to get it away from a collision. But you can have the patient place their tongue in the top of their, the roof of their mouth, up in the top of the palate, and just kind of let their jaw hang, kind of relax the muscles, 
keep their tongue up in the roof of their mouth and then tell them to slowly bring their teeth together and until they hit something, whatever that first point of contact is to stop there. And then slowly from that point forward, bring their teeth all the way together and watch the mandible shift and see if you can figure out what that first point of contact is. Put articulating paper in there and have them reproduce that first point of contact in that slide. And you may be able to go in there and just reduce, say, for example, that distal buckle cuss tip of that lower second molar and actually get them to be able to bite into where their midlines line, where the lower midline lines up with the upper much better than when you started. Okay. So you might be able to win half the battle with some occlusal adjusting before you even start the case. The closer we can get before we start the case, you know, the more predictable the outcome is going to be. Um, so before taking the scan, before submitting, best to see if we can try to figure out where the interference is coming from and reduce or remove that. And then even have them come back, you know, do the, uh, the occlusal adjustment, let them go for a couple of weeks and then come back and repeat the procedure and see if you can get that resolved before you get into your scan that you're going to send off to the aligner company. Okay. And then you're going to repeat this before you do any revision. So while you're in treatment, if you get to the point where it's time to do revision, to, it's time to refinement, you're going to continue this process of trying to identify and get rid of any occlusal interferences that's causing them to want to shift their jaw. And we'd like to get them to where CR, centric relation, and CO, centric occlusion, um, matches, right? So that their teeth are aligned and fit together in the position where their jaw, jaw joint is the most comfortable and, and most happy, okay? And then again, you would want to do that at the end of the case before you do your scans for the retainers. And you'll probably even, you know, during that first six months when you're monitoring the retention, you're going to want to continue to check for that and help them to get a nice balanced occlusion by adjusting with a, a handpiece and articulating paper so that by the end of your six months of retention where you're actively checking, you know, I have my patients come in at one month, three months, and six months for retainer checks. And I'm looking to with articulating paper to see if they're getting a nice balanced occlusion on their posterior teeth or if they have premature contacts that I can adjust so that I can help them develop a nice occlusion and you know, by the time I'm done, I want to have nice balanced occlusion on the left and right sides and the back. And I want to have very light contacts on the front teeth so that when I put my finger over their front teeth and have them bite up and down, I don't have any heavy fremitus or heavy, you know, uh, vibration pushing. If I can feel when they bite together that the lower teeth are still wanting to push the upper teeth out, I need to continue doing some adjusting until everything gets settled with nice, solid contacts in the back and very light uh, contacts on the front teeth when they're in centric occlusion. So they can be challenging cases, but they can also be successful cases. And it makes a real big difference in the life of this patient because now their jaw joint and their teeth function in the same position. Okay. So what we're going to see in this case that we're going to look at is that because Don, as he set up this case, recognized the problem, he asked for the technician to do a what we call a, a hinge axis rotation of the mandible. Okay, he basically pointed out to them that there was a shift and that he wanted them to do a hinge axis rotation to get the midlines to line up. So here's the upper midline, which is aligned with the face. Here's the lower. And we want them to shift the mandible over until the midlines line up. And that's where we want all the teeth to fit together, okay? And we're not actually shifting the teeth all around. We actually are just assuming that if the lower arch were to just shift on its like a hinge point, that we could get the uh, upper and lower midline to line up, that this is the position that we want all the teeth to fit together in. This is our goal. Okay. And because it was set up like that, it was very successful. Um, but there could have been some things done that would have been not successful. For example, if we had decided, oh, when we look at this case, you'll see that there's a lot of class two on the left side compared to the right. So it might have been tempting to say, well, let's extract a bicuspid up there, you know, which is an error that even many orthodontists make. Okay, let's just take out one bicuspid on the side that's class two. And that way we can just make that side class one. But what will happen is we'll end up shifting the upper midline over to the lower midline 
towards the side of the extraction, and now it no longer lines up with the facial midline. And we've created dental asymmetry in an arch that never was asymmetrical. Okay, or we might be tempted to do um, unilateral distalization. So we might say, well, let's distalize only on the upper left side. Let's use the aligners and just distalize on the left side, which is the same as extracting on that side. It creates dental asymmetry in what was a symmetrical arch and it shifts the upper midline. Or we might be tempted to say, let's do a lot of unilateral IPR. Let's do a lot of IPR in between the teeth on just the upper left side and we'll fix the problem that way. Same thing. It's just like extracting on one side where in this case, and there are some cases where truly there's a significant amount of dental asymmetry. And that may be a good solution, but you would have to prove that you have significant dental asymmetry in that arch so that you know, hey, this is all shifted like this because there's a tooth blocked out or because there's a tooth missing or because, you know, a primary tooth was lost early and everything shifted. And if in that situation, it might be something that could be treated that way successfully. But if you have asymmetry in the arches and you misdiagnose it, you could end up creating dental asymmetry in an arch that was symmetrical. And basically what needed to happen was we needed to align the teeth in a way that allowed and encouraged the mandible to shift back into its home position, its most comfortable position, and let the teeth line up in that position rather than forcing all the teeth over to align where the, the shift is, basically forcing the centric relation when all the teeth are straightened over to, you know, this position of the mandible that's not centric occlusion. So we're going to see in the setup that at the very end, the technician provides a final stage that's orange and is labeled with a J. And this is not an actual aligner stage. So like if the last one is number 20, we're going to get an aligner number 20, but we're not going to get an aligner that goes with this J position because all they're doing here is in the setup, they're going to shift the jaw over on this hinge axis rotation so that you can see how the teeth will line up if in fact there was a functional shift and we're able to get the patient to stop shifting. Okay, so it's basically just a final position that they show us so that we can visually evaluate how the teeth are lined up in that position, but it's not an actual aligner. There's nothing happening to make that make that shift at the end. And you guys will see shifts like this with dental open bite cases. Sometimes they'll do an open bite setup where all of the teeth basically end up with open bite all the way around. And then they give you a final position where they just jump into occlusion. And you're like, well, what is that last aligner? It's just a visual stage to show you what it will look like when the patient bites together. Or maybe you've used some class two elastics and you've asked for a class two elastic simulation. And at the end, they show this jump. So the final stage shows this jump where the mandible moves forward. And that's just saying, hey, if you were able to get the class two elastics to pull the jaw forward or pull the teeth forward or whatever, here's how the teeth would fit if you were in class one. Okay. And so you'll see in these setups, depending on what you ask for and how you're treating, you'll see a stage that's orange, that's labeled with a J. And you just have to realize that that indicates a visual jump. Just they're moving the mandible to a different position so that you can visualize it in that position. But the aligners are doing nothing to get that for you. Okay. You are going to have to produce that with some other things like elastics, like the way we've aligned the teeth. Okay, every case is different, but just realize what that J is when we go and look at this case. Just want to real quick, um, I know you, most of you know this, but just to revisit because there is some intrusion that we're doing in this case, what is the difference between pure intrusion versus relative intrusion? Okay, so pure intrusion is straight up or down intrusion of the teeth vertically. Like in this diagram over here, if the tooth starts at this level and we just intrude it so that the apex ends up above its starting position, we've just vertically intruded that tooth straight up, that would be pure intrusion, which is difficult to get with any appliance, okay? Um, aligners may be a little bit better at it than braces, but as we'll see in this case, even when you program intrusion, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get pure intrusion okay it's very it's a difficult um, movement to get unless you apply 
skeletal anchorage, which we're not going to go into in this particular to- uh, webinar. Okay. But um, short of skeletal anchorage, it's difficult to get pure intrusion with, with any appliance. Relative intrusion is when the cusp or the incisal edge does end up vertically in a higher position, but it wasn't because the apex was actually intruded. The apex is at the same vertical position, but because the inclination of the tooth has changed, as that crown tips out to the buckle, okay, it tips out around the center of resistance of the tooth. And so as it tips out and the crown gets buckle crown tip, the starting vertical position of the incisal edge versus the final vertical position of the incisal edge, it is different. You might have a millimeter or two millimeters of difference, but it didn't come from pure intrusion. It came from relative intrusion. Okay, so just keep that in mind as we look at this case as well. Here uh, is the way that Don sets up his lateral ceph tracing in order to produce a VTO when he's going to be applying intrusion is he went in and manually took this tooth and moved it straight up, okay? And then runs the uh, runs the VTO off of that in order to get some intrusion if he's planning that intrusion. So here's where you guys might, well, starting the next slide, you might wanna start taking some photos of your screen, but this is a routine for checking your 3D setups. It's six steps that we're gonna show you that Don does, I like to do as well that we recommend for you as a protocol, just six steps that you would follow as a checklist whenever you're gonna evaluate a 3D setup from progressive aligners or any aligner company. Okay, obviously, in addition to these six steps, you would also read the instructions or comments from the technician. Whenever the technician sends a case back to you, they always give you some notes. They might say, I've done this, you need to start elastics here, and they'll give you some comments Maybe they'll say, I wasn't able to do this because of this. And so they'll give you comments there you want to read. Um, You'll want to do some static checks, just going from start to finish, start to finish, start to finish to compare the start to the final. But we'll talk about that in these six steps up here. Um, The purpose of this review, this six step review is to decide whether you can approve this setup that you're looking at or whether you need to write some new instructions or maybe use the 3D tools to do some modifications, okay? And with other aligner companies, generally we have a lot of of these back and forths. I would say with other aligner companies that I have worked with or that I have done consulting or mentoring with other doctors, um, the number of times that I've approved the first setup is probably somewhere in the zero to 5% range. It's hardly ever. Um, There's always something that needs to be modified, something needs to be improved. When you go through these six steps, there's something that you're like, okay, well, I like most of this, but I don't like this. Or, you know, there's a whole bunch of things I don't like. And I end up giving them a list or I end up going in and using the 3D doctor edit tools to change some things. Um, We're finding with progressive aligner setups though, that there are a lot of cases, I would say maybe 50%, which is a huge change from like zero to five, maybe 50% of the cases where I'm like, it looks great. They followed all the instructions. Everything looks really good. I'm really happy with it. Um, And when there are changes, usually they're little things like, you know, I want to add some class two elastic cutouts, or I'd like to reduce the amount of this or change that a little bit, or I just want to go in and tweak the way that they've positioned that tooth a little bit. Okay. So the, the first setup is getting us way closer, if not all the way there. And there's a lot less of this back and forth. But we're trying to decide whether we can approve the setup or whether we need to modify. This is really important, guys. Plan to invest time on this step, okay? This is where you're going to get successful cases. With braces, we do want to plan. And I think we in progressive orthodontics do a lot more planning than most orthodontists do because we don't just get the brackets out and throw them on. Our goal isn't to put brackets on the day they walk in. We do sit down with a case. We do think through. We do diagnose. We do treatment plan. But even with all of that, I still, when the patient comes in, I'm still looking and um, making adjustments and making decisions as I go. But with the aligners, once I've approved a setup, whatever I put in is what I'm going to get out. Nothing's going to happen that wasn't programmed in. And so if I put in 
a great amount of effort and time to make sure that the setup is good, I'm going to get aligners that are going to give me a good result. If I really just gloss over it and don't spend any time really looking at it, I'm going to get whatever I put into it, which sometimes is I put no effort in, I'm going to get something that's not very good out. One of the reasons why we're excited about progressive aligners is because the stagers, the technicians are so educated, they are so experienced and well-trained, they do follow protocols that are highly predictable. And so therefore, you're going to have to spend less time. They're going to get you closer, but we still want you to spend time. Plan on spending 20 to 40 minutes sitting down with a case by the time you open it, read the instructions, go back and look at what you originally planned, go back and look at your diagnosis, your VTO, what your in parameters were that you set, and compare to what they gave you. It takes some time to do that. But um, I think of it like crockpot cooking. If you guys know what a crockpot is, right? It's that thing you Sunday morning, you throw the all the ingredients in and then turn it on and walk away for five or six hours. And when you come back, you have this great meal. But whatever I put in is what ended up in that meal. If I put in, took the time to put in a lot of really great spices and a lot of really great ingredients, and it all sits in there and slow cooks together, I get a really great outcome. If I forgot to put something in, if I didn't take the time to just really focus in on what I put in at the beginning, at the end of those five, six hours, when I go to have that meal, like it's either in there or it's not in there. And it's that way with aligners. It's like, if you take the time up front to do the thinking, to do the planning, to really look at these setups, that's like putting all the ingredients in. Okay. And then when you hit approve, now you've got aligners that are going to come back and do the slow cooking for your um, patients because it's just, you know, these little minute changes, these little small changes in every step. And every one of those little steps has whatever ingredients that you put into it. And so if you put good ingredients in, you're going to get good stuff out. If you put very little time into it and, you know, you really didn't make an effort, then you're going to get out whatever the technician put in there for you. Okay, so this is really a place where you can can and should spend your effort. And if you do a great job on the initial setup and then the patient does a great job wearing the aligners, you should be able to get a great result out of your case. So. Making sure I, everybody's I see some notes popping up over here. It looks like we're all still seeing well. OK, thanks, Don, for that note. Okay, so here you go. Pull your phones out, take a picture. Here are the six steps by the McGann Lala liner team. Their six steps routine for checking a 3D setup. And we're going to go through each one of these. So step one, compare the VTO and your in parameters that you decided on as a doctor. Because remember, the technician is not the doctor. They're not the ones deciding on treatment. You are. Okay. We don't rely on them to decide how to treat the case. We decide how to treat the case and we tell them how to treat the case. And then we work, you know, we're working with a great company who can interpret what we gave them and give us back something that matches what we asked for. Um, but we don't rely on them to make those decisions for us. So compare your treatment decisions, your VTO, your in parameters to what you got back. Paying special attention to midlines, the vertical dimension the sagittal, the anterior, posterior, basically the occlusion and the transverse dimension. Okay. Look at each of the three different dimensions that we work in. And don't forget about the cortical bone limits and the facial balance. You know, so, so often you get back into just a 3D setup and all you're looking at is these teeth in a cartoon in three dimensions. And you forget that there's lips, there's a facial balance, there's bones, there's cortical bone limits. And it looks so easy to move teeth around in digital space, but is that actually going to happen in the patient's mouth? Are their bones going to allow that? Are we moving teeth outside of the limits of the bone? Um, are we going to make them look better or worse the way that we're moving the teeth in this setup based on their starting facial balance? Okay, these are the things we're thinking about. Step two, we're going to look at the expansion. If we asked for it, was it applied? How was it applied? We're going to look at rotations. Are the rotations being done in a way that doesn't cause collisions? Is there adequate space? Is the timing right? Are the uh, are the um, attachments needed there? We're going to look at the IPR. You know, did they apply what we asked? Did they apply it in places where we didn't want it? Uh, what stage is it being applied at? We'll go over all these in a minute as we go through these slides. Okay, we go tooth by tooth through the setup, and we look at the individual tooth alignment, the torque, the angulation, the inclined planes. 
Step four, we look at the attachments. Are they appropriate? Do we have all the ones we need? Do we have ones we don't need? Are there cutouts where we ask for them? If we're planning on doing class two elastics or cross elastics, are those cutouts there? If we have a jump, you know, like we was explaining, do I see what's happening with the little jump? And do I know what additional forces I need to apply to help that happen? Which we'll talk about in this case. If I ask for other features like lingual bite ramps, um, is it present? Okay, so any features that I wanted in the aligners, are they there? Uh, what is the rate of tooth movement? Are they moving the teeth too fast? Are they moving the teeth too slow? Um, and then I'm going to evaluate if I'm going to have auxiliary forces like class two elastics, at what stage should I start that? Okay, and we'll talk about that. So let's go through each one of these. And so as we go through these six steps, you might want to take a picture of each one of these slides. Um, so you'll end up with seven pictures, one that has the outline of the six steps and then more detail on each one of the, the six steps. So step one, VTO and in parameters versus the 3D setup. Okay, so we made as doctors, we made decisions in SmileStream in our two-dimensional VTO. And we gave instructions to the technician regarding the anterior posterior, like what did we want to do with the occlusion? Did we want to leave it slightly class two? Did we want to fix it to a class one occlusion? What are we doing in the anterior posterior? What did we want to do with the front teeth? Did we want the front teeth to procline? Did they start out retroclined and we want them to procline? Or did they start out too proclined and we wanted to retrocline them? Or do we want to maintain the inclinations? We need to see what did they do and what was it that we wanted when we looked at the case. We want to look at the skeletal resistance and say, you know, where are my teeth going to feel a wall where they can't go any further? You know, so if I have a bunch of dental class two, but I also have skeletal class two, I don't have bone where I need to put the teeth. Okay. So if they're in the setup, if they're bodily moving those teeth into a space where I look at the Ceph and I'm like, there's no bone there to put the teeth there. If the crowns of the teeth are going to go there, the roots are going to have to stay back where the bone is. They're going to end up very proclined. Okay. We have to think through where is this case going to feel resistance from the cortical plate, from the skeleton. If we're doing a bunch of expansion, you know, where do we have a nice big alveolar process that looks like the cortical plate is, you know, way out there on the buckle and there's room to move teeth to the buckle? Or does it look like these teeth started out already flared to the buckle because there's no bone any further out? So if we expand further, there's no way the roots can come with those crowns. We're just going to keep tipping the crowns out. And then I look back at the profile and go, did this patient start off with a concave profile where their lips were sunken in too far back and they were under supported and thin. And I wanted them to go the teeth to come forward so that the lips were more full and the profile was more full. Did they do that? Or maybe I started off with a profile that was too pro protruded and the lips were sticking out too far and too full. And I wanted to reduce that and bring them back. Did that actually happen? Are my teeth moving back in the setup? Or maybe they had a really nice facial balance and I wanted to maintain that. And if I want to maintain their facial balance, then the incisors better be finishing about where they started. And if they're not, then we're going to have a change in the profile. Okay. In a minute, we'll show you what the superimposition tool is, but we use the superimpose tool in the setup to be able to visualize these changes. But we can also use another feature called the key tooth tool, which I'll show you in a minute, which actually quantifies how many millimeters or degree of change they applied to the setup. And it will show a liner by a liner. So you're like in that aligner, it went from this to this, or you can go from the beginning of the whole setup to the end and see what the totals are throughout the treatment. So you can either visualize it by looking at the superimposition tool, or you can see the actual data by looking down at this key tooth tool, which we'll show you in a second. But what we're trying to decide is, does this setup that the technician gave us match and coordinate with what we decided the in parameter instructions were basically in parameter, meaning I decided where the final position of the teeth should be. Okay. I'm the one deciding how far the teeth can move, how far they should move based on bones, based on profile of the face, based on thickness of gum tissue. Okay. Your technician is not going to look at that and make those decisions for you. That's you as a doctor. Okay. So I'm going to determine how much overjet I have at the end. Do I want to try to get to ideal overjet on this case? Or do I know that that's not possible on this case and we're going to accept a compromise? 
I'm going to determine what the amount of overbite is that I want at the end. I'm going to determine whether I want overcorrections in the final position. And I'm going to determine what the occlusal classification is at the end. Okay. And so I want the technician to follow what I asked for. We'll talk more about overcorrections, but we know that the aligners are flexible and therefore there's weakness in being able to give us full corrections and things like rotations, things like deep bites. Okay. And so oftentimes we want to over engineer the plastic or overcorrect so that a rotation that was mesial ends up three degrees distally rotated because we know that we're not going to get everything that we see in the setup. So if we want to even get a chance of getting straight, we need to overcorrect some of these things. Okay. So we'll talk more about that in a minute. So the superimposition tool is helpful at looking at how much did we expand? How much did we intrude in the vertical dimension? Um, is the intrusion or extrusion as instructed for leveling? Is it reasonable? Okay. So we'll look at that in a sec. Curve of speed. Did it level the way we requested? So that's step one. Step two is to evaluate the expansion and rotations in the IPR. By the way, in, in step one, we're going to be looking at the teeth in occlusion, the upper and lower arches in occlusion from the front view and from the left and right side views. Okay. Because that's where we're looking at the posterior relationship, posterior occlusion. Um, it's where we're looking at the uh, inclinations of the teeth, where we're looking at overjet, overbite. Okay. And when we go to the rotations and expansion and IPR, I'm usually looking at individual upper and lower occlusal views to evaluate these things. So this is where you can push play or where I like to grab the little slider, which I'll show you in a minute and actually slide it back and forth and just visualize, you know, are, is there expansion happening? This is where you can turn on the, uh, superimpose tool as well and see when you look down at the occlusal view how much expansion did i get start versus finish you can get on the start and final um, positions on the little clicker on the bottom which i'll show you in a second and you can flip back and forth and visualize these things but you're going to look for was expansion applied where was it applied do i like the way it was applied is that what i wanted is that reasonable for this particular patient okay and then same thing with the rotations did they fully correct the rotations or am I undercorrected in the final position? Okay. Did I request overcorrection? So if I have some more severe rotations, I want to indicate to the technician that I want to overcorrect those by two or three degrees, which isn't visible to the patient. Even if I do end up fully overcorrected in their mouth by two or three degrees, that's not really visible to the patient. But now I know I got the, ro the rotation fully corrected and if there's any relapse at all, it's going to relapse towards straight rather than relapsing towards the look that they were trying to fix in the first place. But just realize that these aligners, there's material inefficiency, even in brackets. OK, there's inefficiency. And that's why when Don created the IP appliance, the individual patient appliance, he created brackets that are rotation brackets that have three to four degrees of correction or overcorrection so that we can actually overcome the inefficiency of the appliance and get the teeth all the way corrected. So we're going to view the superimposition, but I like to go this like sliding the slider back and forth, which I'll show you in a minute. And then this view we also look at was IPR added, what stage was it added? And for me, are the teeth aligned when the IPR is scheduled? Okay, I don't want to be doing IPR when the teeth are not aligned. So if I have a lower incisor that looks like this, and I have another lower incisor that looks like this, I don't want to be doing IPR at that stage because I'm going to be cutting away the wrong part of the tooth. I want to be doing the IPR, looking down from the occlusal view, when my incisors look like this, because now when I go cut in between there, I'm removing the actual true contact. Okay, so sometimes if I see that they've applied the IPR when it's not aligned properly, I say, please do not apply IPR until the true contacts are fully aligned. Okay, but this is a preference that we've set already. So you shouldn't be seeing IPR added to your progressive aligner cases when the teeth are still overlapped. Um, but you still need to look out for it, okay, because it can still happen.
I thought I put this slide in later. I'm going to come back to this slide. Let's go to step three through six, and then we'll come back to that one where it shows the tools. Uh, step three, look at individual tooth torque, angulation, incline plane. So this is where I'm checking tooth by tooth just to make sure that I like the position of each tooth. You know, sometimes I can see when I look tooth by tooth, I go, oh, these two bicuspids, one of them has its root more to the lingual and one of them has its root more to the labial, even though the crowns are basically aligned. I can see when I look from the occlusal that they have different root torque. Or I'll look down on the lower incisors and yes, they've aligned all the, the edges, the incisal edges are aligned. But when I look down through the tooth, just by based on the crown, I can see that those roots have different torque. Okay, so I can either go in and use the 3D tool and change the torque until they're the same, or I can ask the technician to please align, you know, the lower 3-1 and the 4-1 so that the roots have the same torque. Okay, do they look symmetrical left versus right? So I'm going to look at the teeth on the left versus the teeth on the right, both in the front and in the back, and make sure that we have consistent alignment um, and that every tooth looks like it's aligned properly because it's easy for the technician sometimes to just align the crowns of the teeth. And since they don't really have roots to, to work with, um, they don't see what you and I can see when we look at a tooth where we can kind of visualize where that root is going based on the anatomy of the crown. If we asked for buccal root torque, for example, and we expanded, did we actually get that? Right? Why do we do expansion? And again, this is one of the things with progressive aligners that we've already put into the protocols. So you should always get it when you get expansion, but you want to check to make sure it's there. When we expand in the upper, okay, we're going to push those crowns out to the buckle. The tendency is for the roots to stay put and for the crowns to just tip to the buckle. If the crowns tip out to the buckle, here's a example of that. If the crown just tips out to the buckle, that's going to allow the palatal root to drop down. And so the palatal root drops down and that creates a premature contact with the lower and it ends up looking like a posterior open bite. Because when you look from the buckle, there's the space between the upper and lower tooth. So it looks like there's like an open bite, but in reality, they're hitting on this palatal cusp that's hanging down too low. So when we push, the tooth out to the buckle, we want to put extra labial root torque. We actually want to push the roots further than we're pushing the crown. So essentially the teeth are going to move out to the buckle, but there will be extra labial root torque by the time it gets out to the buckle compared to a start position. Okay. And we can visualize that by looking from the back of the mouth, you know, switching it around the view from the lingual side. And when we watch the upper molars move out for the expansion, we should be able to tell whether the roots look like they're going with it bodily or whether the roots are actually moving further to the labial compared to the crowns. And I know you can't see the roots, but you can see the inclination of the crown. And they will, you'll kind of see the, the gums, the simulated gum tissue will kind of swell to the buckle when they've changed the torque of the crown to represent labial root torque being applied. What we're just doing that is kind of an overcorrection. It's an over-engineering of the plastic to try to avoid tipping the crowns of the buckle and having that palatal root hang down and causing a collision. Um, individual irregularly worn incisors and canines. Okay, this is one of the things that actually, when you look at these setups, it's difficult for the technician to know really how to align these teeth if you have irregularly worn incisors and canines. You might have a canine that's completely worn flat on the right side and on the upper left, there's nowhere because of the alignment and they still have a sharp cusp tip. And so when you try to make this setup look aesthetic, it's very difficult for the technician because you have two different teeth. The, the symmetry of the right versus the left are they're completely different teeth. And so do you make the gum line, you know, the gingival zenith line up and then have one hanging down lower than the other? Or do you make the, the tip of one line up with the flat version of the other and now the gingival zeniths are off? And same thing with the front teeth. If you have one central incisor that was more lingual and got worn off compared to the one that was pushed out to the buckle and didn't get very much wear, when you line them up, 
is the technician supposed to line up the incisal edges and have the gingival zenith off, or are they supposed to line up the gingival zenith and have the incisal edges off? Okay, so these are things that the technician really can't decide for you. There's something that you have to make a decision on. And so do you need to plan a restoration? You can have a discussion with the patient about um, lining up the gingival zenith on the central incisors and then doing a veneer on one or maybe a veneer on both of the upper central so that you have symmetrical sized teeth. Or do we want to go back in and grind down the one that didn't wear so that it matches the one that did wear so that we can line up incisal edges and gingival, um, the gingival margins? And sometimes it didn't wear straight. So you have like the mesial side is worn down and the distal side isn't worn at all within one tooth. And so do you prioritize the root alignment and make the root alignment ideal? Or do you prioritize the incisal edge, which is worn irregularly, right? So here's your tooth and the tooth is worn like this, right? So when the tooth is aligned properly, the incisal edge isn't aligned properly. So are you gonna go in and grind off that incisal edge and make it flat and perpendicular to the long axis of the tooth? Or is the technician supposed to take this irregularly worn incisal edge and line it up and now your root is out of alignment? Okay, so there are challenges for the technician when we have irregularly worn incisors and canines and it's best before we go and take a scan, it's best for us to go through and try to make the left and the right side symmetrical. So we're dealing with symmetrical teeth. So the canines have the same amount of wear and shapes. The lateral incisors have the same amount of wear and shapes and heights compared, you know, one versus the other. The incisal edges are straight and perpendicular to the long axis of the tooth. The two centrals are the same height, same wear patterns. Okay. Or, and if not, we're going to have to do some bonding at the end, or we're going to have to do some, maybe some temporary bonding before we start. And so the technician can line them up properly. And then you're going to veneer that at the end. Okay. So these are things that we have to look at as we're evaluating the setups and go, if I had irregularly worn incisors and canines, what did the technician do with it? And is that meet our goals, what the patient and I want to accomplish? All right. Step four, we take a picture of this one. We evaluate the features, okay? The attachments, the cutouts, the ramps, the, the jump, okay? We look at what was added into this case. Is it what I wanted? Is it appropriate? Do I need it? Okay? So you can go through and, and take the little slider and slide it back and forth and watch the movie play quickly and go, hey, what teeth seem to really jump out to my eye is having a lot of rotation or having a lot of root tipping or root torquing going on? And do we have an attachment place on that tooth to help accomplish that? Are there teeth being intruded? Are there teeth being extruded? Are there attachments to help accomplish that? Um, are there too many attachments on the teeth? Okay, you'll find with uh, progressive aligners, the default um, trim is a scallop trim line that is at the gingival margin. This is very comfortable for the patient. It looks nice. Um, it's easy for them to get the aligners in and out. Um, but it requires more attachments because of the flexibility of the aligner. So if I'm going with the default scallop trim line, I generally let them place attachments wherever the computer software says it need, needs an attachment um, to make sure that the teeth move. But I can also request a high straight trim line with progressive aligners if it's a case where I have a lot of torque that I'm trying to apply to the teeth. I want to really engage those gingival undercuts Maybe I have short clinical crowns and I want to really grab as much of the tooth as I can. Um, maybe it's somebody who's going to be going off to college. And I'm not going to see them very often or they're in the military and I want to eliminate altogether the attachments or, or just really reduce the number of attachments. And so I want to get more retentive aligners by going with a straight high trim line. Okay, so whatever our goals are, we need to evaluate the attachments. Are they appropriate? Are there too many? Are there too few? And But again, with progressive aligners, you'll find that the default, what the technician puts on there is usually pretty appropriate. Um, and, and I've been pretty happy with it. I find that with other companies, I'm constantly saying, change the orientation of this one to vertical or horizontal, remove this one, add some over here. I don't do that very often with progressive aligners. They really do a good job of placing those. Um, 
Are the bevels facing the gingival to help the patient remove the tray and avoid chipping of the attachments? Again, usually these are appropriately placed, um, but you can evaluate that. Um, if planning interarch elastics, are the cutouts made and are the jumps available? And are there jumps? Oh, too many, too many there, there those in here. Are the jumps and available anterior overjet to accept the class two jump? Okay, basically, if we're planning on class two, class three, or cross arch elastics, we need to ask for button cutouts, which I'll show you again in this case, um, in order to allow us to put buttons on the teeth. Okay, we used to have to manually do this. If we were using, let's say, for example, clear correct, we'd have to manually do all of these cuts in the aligners. Well, these are provided for you if you ask for them, but we wanna make sure to only put these into the aligners when it's an appropriate time to start using these elastics, okay? And the reason why we wouldn't just, you can start them right at the beginning of the case because it's not like um, braces where you're in a really flexible nickel titanium wire and you're gonna get a bunch of unwanted tooth movements. But the reason why we might want to wait on starting class two elastics is because if we have a lot of rotations to correct, when we start pulling with the elastics, it can basically put some internal pressure that causes a little bit of internal binding of the teeth. And if the teeth are binding against each other, then the rotations don't correct. We like to have a little bit of space between the teeth while we're correcting rotations. Okay, so even if we do start the elastics earlier, because we really want to try to get a jump when the patient is... Um, compliant when they're feeling motivated. If you notice any tracking problems with your rotations, you might want to pull the elastics out and get that tooth back on track because the elastics could be what's kind of binding internally, causing some little internal pressures that are causing those teeth to just, where there would be a little tiny gap, they're actually now pushed up against each other. Okay, and the other thing is overjet. If we don't have when the patient bites together, if there's no overjet for the uh, teeth to kind of move forward into this jump the simulation, then we're not going to get as good of a result from the class two elastic. So we do some planning. Not only are these little cutouts there, but are they being applied when I feel like is the right time to start these um, elastics? If we have the cutouts there early in the case, when we don't need them, it creates flexibility and weakness in the aligner where we don't really want that weakness. It could be right on the canines, could be right on the molars. We could be trying to correct rotations or do some movement that we'd really like full coverage of that tooth. And if we have a cutout present that we're not even using, that could slow down um, the treatment. Other aligner companies, if they do provide cutouts, they really only provide it at the beginning. So if you're going to get it, you're going to get it the whole entire time. And so that weakness is there throughout the whole case. But with progressive aligners, if you say, don't put that cut out there until you know aligner number 10, then it will only be there from number 10 on. And so that's nice because you don't have to have that weakness present in the aligner throughout the whole treatment. If I requested lingual bite ramps or bite turbos on the molars, are those present? Um, you could have a whole discussion on when and why to use those. But basically, anytime we use that, it's usually in deep bite cases and it just props the teeth open. It gives them a vertical stop so that they really can't squeeze on their back teeth and they can't intrude their back teeth. So if it's a deep bite case with strong muscles, it's the purpose is to provide a vertical stop when they have the aligners in so that they can't squeeze and bite on the back of the aligners and cause intrusion in the back teeth, which is fighting against our efforts to correct the deep bite. Okay, and then looking to see what other features they've added. There's things like torque and intrusion rigids, these little blue lines that they put on the teeth to indicate that there's going to be little positive pressure in those areas. Nothing, there's nothing you need to do differently, but just so if the patient goes, what's this in my aligner? You look at it and you're like, oh, that's a little positive pressure ridge to help put torque or to help intrude that tooth. Okay, so you evaluate these features. Step five, you can grab a picture of this. open my door it's getting warm in here okay so step five would be a rate of tooth movement the velocity or rate not defined but can be seen in the number of aligners and how fast the teeth move when the video is played okay we're set to have 0.25 millimeters per tray is the maximum amount of movement because that is how much 
space there is basically your a 0.25 millimeter movement would compress the root of that tooth right up against the wall of the um the alveol the alveolus um, basically compress the periodontal ligament space and that prompts the body to remodel okay so if we were to go faster than that it's just not going to happen um, but we can ask for slower tooth movement either by asking them to move slower at say for example 0.1 millimeters per aligner one degree of rotation Okay. Or you can ask them to increase the number of aligners. You can say, I like this setup. There's only 20 aligners. I'd like the same setup in 30 aligners, which basically makes it more predictable. The other thing that progressive aligners has is what they call a periodontal protocol. So if you have a case that has periodontal disease that you have under control and the patient's healthy, but you have some bone loss from periodontal disease, you can ask for the periodontal protocol for tooth movement. And it's basically half the speed of what the normal protocols are. Okay, so the normal protocols are maximum of 0.25 millimeters uh, linear movement per aligner and maximum of 1.8 degrees of rotation or root tipping if they're doing any of that. Okay, but you can slow that down to half if you ask for the perio protocol. Okay. We can also see this in the key tooth tool, which I'll show you in a second, where you can actually see the numbers and how much they're actually moving the teeth. Okay. So we're going to evaluate the, the speed. And I've seen this in other aligner companies where something will come back. And maybe it was because the doctor said they wanted a, um, a light case or, or they want a case that's only 20 aligners long, but it really the case needs 30 aligners or 35 aligners to accomplish it at the proper rate. And that's why we're encouraging you with progressive aligners to select the option when you submit that says, choose the product after I see the treatment plan, rather than say, I want the progressive 30 case or the progressive 20 case or the progressive 10 case. Okay, choose the product after I see the setup, because then they're going to apply the best protocols that move the teeth at the ideal velocity and then when you see it, you're like, okay, that's 24 aligners when I didn't restrict them. So therefore I could choose the progressive 30 uh, product and be safe. Or maybe I sent some potential issues with this case and I see that there might be multiple revisions. So I'm gonna go with an unlimited one just to make sure that I, I'm not restricted on how many aligners I can get and how long it's gonna take. There is a restriction, but it's five years, which is a long time with the unlimited one, okay? So generally the limits that we put is we don't want to expand any more than two millimeters per side. Okay. Plus we're going to want to add buckle root torque. This says plus any buckle crown torque needed to upright, which basically means if you have an upper molar that starts off or upper bicuspids that start off with a little bit of, this is exaggerated, but a little bit of lingual crown torque. And it takes me, I don't know, a millimeter of movement to get to where basically the tooth is just upright. I'm not including that in my two millimeters. Because once I have the tooth upright, if it started out tipped to the lingual, because you guys have all seen those cases where when the patient smiles, the bicuspids and even the first molar, they just look like they're tipping inward towards the, the lingual. Tipping them back out until they're basically straight up and down is not really included in that number. Okay, once we have them straight up and down from there, we would want to limit to two millimeters per side for, for expansion. And then we would want to make sure that there's buccal root torque being added from that point on. Okay, intrusion of upper, lower incisors, we're going to limit to two millimeters per arch. Doesn't mean you're going to get two millimeters, but that's what we're going to limit it to. Okay, distalization of upper molars, we're going to limit to two millimeters unless we are extracting upper sevens and I'll add to that upper eights. Okay. If you're extracting some teeth in the upper, then you might go as much as four millimeters, but don't expect that you're going to get, you know, to fix six to eight millimeters of dental class two with distalizing. You're not going to distalize that much. Class two elastics. If you're going to allow them to do that simulated jump at the end, uh, I wouldn't expect anything more than three. And I think three is pretty optimistic. Okay, I think two millimeters is about the most I would expect to get with that as well. Incisor retraction or advancement, that's limited by the cortical bone and by their profile. Okay, so how much is too much retraction or how much is too much advancement? It depends on their gum tissue thickness. It depends on their cortical plate, like how do the bones relate? Where is the actual bone? 
And what is their profile? Can their lips afford to be pushed further out? Can their lips afford to come back? That's what's determining those limits. Okay. And last step here is we already talked about this a little bit when to start the auxiliary forces. Okay. So if we're going to do class two elastics or class three elastics or cross arch elastics, again, I mentioned this elastics can close those little spaces that you needed to correct the rotations, causing little micro collisions inside the aligner. And so therefore loss of tracking and anterior overjet is needed for the class two elastics to be effective for the teeth to have a space to move into. So it's best to wait for rotations to be nearly corrected and for anterior overjet to be present. So let's say your upper incisors, as we'll see in this case, they start tipped lingually and you start putting elastics in, there's nowhere for the lower teeth to go. They're slamming into the upper, even with the aligners in, you know, the patient bites together, they're still feeling that upper aligner. And so it's going to be more effective to have the patient wear the elastics when they've uprighted those tipped back upper incisors. And now you have some overjet to be able to get those movement of those lower teeth. Okay. So you can determine that by looking at the setup and then request as needed. All right. So let me go back to this. Looks like a lot on this page, but I basically just took a bunch of screenshots of some of the tools that are inside of the doctor portal. And I just want to explain them quickly to you. Okay. So over here on the right hand side, when Dr. McGann in his setups or in his uh, presentations is talking about the key tooth tool, he's referring to this little tool at the bottom left side of the doctor portal. And it pops up and like the way to turn it on and off is with this little button over here that says TM table. That means tooth movement table. If I click that button on the left side of the screen, this little tool will turn on and off. When it's on, then I have to go click on a tooth. Okay. So here, when I click on this one five, it lights up gold or yellow or whatever color that is. And then it gives me the numbers down here. So if I've clicked over to, let's say, a liner number nine on the very bottom little scroll bar, and then I click this tooth and it shows me these numbers, that says that from the start to a liner number nine, it's put this amount of movement on that tooth. So if I go click to the very end, say I click on number 20 at the very end, then it will show me all of the numbers from zero to 20. It'll say, okay, total, you did six degrees of distal angulation, 3.8 degrees of mesial rotation. I can see the actual amounts right here. So how much expansion did I do? Okay, well, buckle translation, 1.4 millimeters of buckle translation or expansion. Did, there, did they add buckle root torque to it? Yes, they added three degrees of buckle root torque because it was expanding. Okay, so I can see the numbers and actually see in this little tool what they've applied. And then I can click aligner by aligner. And it will, you'll see the changes. So from number eight to number nine, it'll say 1.2 and then it'll go 1.4. So I'm like, okay, between those two, it added 0.2 millimeters. So this is a nice tool to be able to see what's actually happening in our setups. If you like to look at the actual quantity, the number, the number of degrees or millimeters. And what's cool about this is you can quantify it from the perspective of the crown of the tooth or from the imagined root apex. Okay, so I'll get different numbers if I click on root apex versus crown, because maybe my crown isn't moving that far, but my root apex is moving further. And then they can do it based on the estimated center of resistance. So there's three different points of the tooth, right? So if I have a tooth, we'll draw it over here. Whoops, that was not good. It's hard to draw the mouse. Okay, so here's a tooth. Am I measuring it based on where the crown is, where the apex is, or where the center of resistance is? It'll give me these different measurements in each of these three different positions on the tooth. So if you're a numbers person, you'll really like looking at this quantification of number of degrees, number of millimeters. Okay, so that's the tooth movement table or the key tooth tool. But to get those numbers, you have to click on a tooth and it will toggle through the different teeth. 
Okay. You can toggle on and off the attachments so that the attachments show up, or you can see it without the attachments. You could toggle on and off the IPR so that it either shows the IPR. And when you go through the little stages, you know, this will indicate that there's 0.3 millimeters of IPR that's going to be done here, but that actually will turn a different color on the actual stage where it's going to actually be done. If you click on this overbite overjet tool right here, it will turn on this little table up top that shows you what your starting overbite is and what your finishing overbite is, or your starting overjet, your finishing overjet. If you click on the Bolton tool, it will turn on this Bolton analysis table. And then you can say, oh, look at, in this case, the upper arch has bigger teeth compared to the lower arch. In fact, if I measure from the mesial of the six to the mesial of the six, the upper arch is almost four millimeters bigger than the lower. Okay. Which means in order to coordinate these arches, I may end up doing IPR in the upper arch because I have more tooth mass in the upper beyond what I should have to coordinate these arches, okay? I mean, the upper arch should be bigger than the lower, but this is taking that into account. The Bolton analysis is saying your upper arch is actually, you know, 3.92 millimeters bigger than it should be to coordinate with the lower arch. From the three to the three, it's 2.83 millimeters bigger. So I may need upper IPR, as you can see is being applied here, in order to coordinate these arches so that when I have dental class one in the occlusion, I also have ideal anterior overjet. Sometimes it'll show that the lower arch is bigger, which means I'd either have to do some lower IPR or I'd have to leave some spaces in the upper or maybe I have kind of peg laterals in the upper and that's why the lower is bigger and I might have to restore my uppers to a bigger size. So there's a Bolton analysis tool. Um, other tools that you have, you have the little slider on the bottom. You've got the little play button. You can play the thing or you can click to the beginning or the end, toggle back and forth. That's what I was talking about before. You can toggle from end to beginning and back and forth. Um, there's the superimpose tool, which does this. It shows you the gray is where the tooth started and the white is where the tooth ended up. And so you can go, oh, I can see that there was... Visually, I can see that there was expansion added because I can see where the starting position was and where the ending position was. And so clearly there's expansion added here. Or I can go down and look at the actual numbers. I can turn on a grid. You can see here the grid is turned on so that I can actually see quantify visually on a grid how far that tooth has moved. I can change the view from a single arch to a double occlusal arch, to a side-by-side, -side, to a composite view. I have all these different views to click on. I can grab the actual arch and rotate it all around. This Dr. Portal is a really good tool for evaluating these setups. If you click contact, it will show you your contact points. You can compare the start to the finish to see what kind of occlusal context you have at the start and what the estimated finish will be based on the setup. You can turn on tooth numbers. And here you can see that we've got it set up to, you know, one, three, one, four, and it'll actually put those numbers on your teeth so that you can make sure you're communicating properly with the technician if you struggle with tooth numbers. You can turn on the staging tool right here, which shows you a liner by a liner, what's happening, what, what teeth are actively moving. There's so many tools to play with here. Um, you can share. If you want to share this with a colleague or with a mentor or a consultant or even your patient, you can click a little share button and it will let you create a sharing URL with a little password that you can share. If you're going to send this to a mentor consultant, you can turn on tooth numbers, attachments, IPR, superimposition, occlusal contacts. You turn all that stuff on so that when I get your setup, I can see all of these tools. But it, maybe you're sending it to the patient. You just want it to look nice and clean. You can turn all of those off and all they get is the simulation without all those things on it. Okay, so this, these tools, there are a lot of really powerful tools in the doctor portal for you to be able to use to evaluate your setups. So we're anticipating that you will spend some time, you know, spend 30 to 40 minutes um, evaluating your cases so that you put good ingredients in and get something great out. Okay, finishing aligners. 
Uh, Dr. McGann gave a whole entire case presentation on the finishing aligner product, which basically means I started with brackets. I got myself to within 10 aligners to finish up the case and I'm going to finish in aligners. Maybe because they want them off for a wedding or they're going away to college or they're just tired of wearing their braces or I'm tired of having the braces on or I don't want to do the finishing bends, you know, because I would have to look at a case and go, hey, you know, I'm close, but I don't want to put all of these bends in this wire in order to get it finished. So I'm going to go and do a finishing product, which we've discounted if you purchase the brackets from Progressive Dental Supply, the IP appliance. Okay, so I'll refer you to, if you go to the Progressive Orthodontic YouTube channel, you can watch Dr. McGann's um, presentation from last week, or it would be case number four. So look for case presentation number four, and you can watch this finishing aligner uh, presentation. Okay, but that finishing aligner is meant to be a discounted product for those who bought Progressive uh, or Progressive Dental Supply IP appliance um, to give you a, because the, the fee that you're charged is discounted. I don't know what it will be outside of the country here in the US, it's 500 US dollars, and that includes a, a final retainer. And so I think it's a good deal to be able to finish up a case. You can refine your results, get a great finish to help build your career and remove the brackets and finish with aligners instead of doing arch wire bending. Okay, so if you can get within 10 aligner stages, so that would be probably within like a 15 degree rotation or a step up or down of 1.5 millimeters. The periodontal ligament is already widened because you've been in uh, a liner, you've been in braces. So your tray activations can be a little bit greater than normal. Okay. Or you might even diagnose a case where you know you're going to start with brackets and finish with aligners. So I pulled these out of a case that I just looked at yesterday with um, Dr. Lee from North Potomac, Maryland. But this is a case where, you know, we thought, hey, with the amount of, uh, retroclination of those upper incisors, kind of a difficult path of insertion, um, some pretty severe rotations in the lower arch. Everything's just sh just crammed back as a pretty deep bite. Look at how deep that bite is. Maybe not the best idea to just go straight into an aligner. So she put on brackets upper and lower, uh, upper and lower six to six, and did two months in with a round night tie, an 012 two night tie, two months in an 016 night tie, and then two months in an 18 by 25 with SLI brackets upper and lower to help procline the teeth. And so six months of brackets before we started with aligners got us from this to this. And it went from looking like a very difficult deep bite, just difficult looking aligner case to something that probably is within range of finishing up with just a progressive 10 uh, finishing case. So, you know, you can do a lot with just a combination of brackets and aligners. So if you want more information on that, go see Dr. McGann's presentation from two weeks ago. So let's get into this case. Okay, so again, this case was provided by Dr. Lucy Galletley of Queensland, Australia. We're very grateful to her for providing this teaching case and grateful to Dr. McGann for his uh, mentoring of the case and the things that we're gonna learn from this case. It's, it's awesome, so let's check it out. We have a 35-year-old patient, chief complaint, crowded teeth. Um, protrusion is acceptable now, but do not move teeth forward. Uh, apparently, we didn't have a, a lateral view, a profile view of the face, but she had nice facial balance, um, so don't push the lips out any further. Uh, don't pull them back necessarily. Okay, we like the, the starting position of the of the lips. So what do we see in this case? Well, we have an upper midline here, and we have a lower dental midline that's here. So just like we talked about at the beginning of the case, it looks like the midlines are off. There could be, when we see that, there could be a functional shift of the mandible. So what other things are we going to look at? I remember a functional shift of the mandible is going to be rotating around the vertical axis of one condyle and the other one is pulling away from the joint and the mandible is shifting around. Okay, so what other things would I look for if I suspect that maybe 
her mandible is shifted off to her left side. Is her upper midline aligned with her face? Yes, her upper midline looks well aligned with her face. Okay. So I'm going to want to look to see whether there's dental symmetry in the arches. So let's jump to that slide. Here, and these are actually the arches that we looked at previously. Okay. But looking at this uh, model tracing from Dental CAD, we can see that the position of the molars on the lower is symmetrical. So we know the lower teeth are not all shifted around to the left or shifted around to the right. She has dental symmetry. And in the upper arch, same thing. The position of the molars is symmetrical. Okay, so we cannot account for the lower dental midline being shifted because of dental asymmetry. So it's not coming from the teeth being twisted around in her face or in her jaw. Okay, so it has to be coming from something else. So what else are we going to look for um, in this possible functional shift? We're going to look at the occlusion, right, versus left. Okay, and if there's more class two on one side versus the other, or there's class three on one side and class two on the other side, if there's a big difference between the classification, that's also going to support the fact that we might have a functional shift. So in her case, on her right side, I just see a little millimeter right there, maybe a millimeter, two millimeters of depending on you know how you want to look at this with her um the angle this was taken from i'm going to say one to two millimeters of class two on her right side and on her left side it looks like we're about six millimeters of class two okay so there's definitely a four millimeter difference of the amount of class two on the right versus the left so that four millimeter difference in classification from one side versus the other when i have symmetrical arches oops there we go when i have symmetrical arches this difference is telling me i either have skeletal asymmetry or i really am shifting the mandible around to one side okay so what else can i look for well, I'm going to look for the overjet. And what's interesting in this case is if I look at the overjet in this picture right here, it actually looks like there's more overjet on the left side, which would not support our idea of a functional shift. Because if the mandible is shifting this way, her midline is off to her left versus relative to the upper. There's, you know, kind of closer to class one on the right side and more class two on the left, which would again um agree with the fact that her mandible is shifting but when i look at the overjet it looks like there's more overjet on the left and less on the right and that wouldn't support the idea of a functional shift but look at this next picture and i don't know what she did differently between these two pictures what i can see happened for sure is that there were composite veneers some doctor had placed composite veneers on these teeth to try to take these upper incisors that were kind of tipping real far to the lingual, they tried to bring them out buckly with this composite veneer. Okay. And so what was done correctly was that composite was removed and the teeth were cleaned up and polished so that we're now dealing with the actual tooth versus this bulked up tooth with the improper shape and size because it's got composite veneer. Okay, so please, when you see these types of things, if you can, please get the tooth back to its ideal shape and size before you scan and send it off. We want tooth anatomy that's going to be ideal in the final position, not whatever messed up shape we have to start with. Okay, so here's your before the veneers were moved and after. But interestingly, when I look at these pictures, um, I don't know, maybe she wasn't biting down all the way in this picture. Uh but when I look at this picture, it looks like the overjet doesn't really agree with the idea that there's a functional shift. But in this picture, it does look like when I look at this posterior segment over here, it looks like there's insufficient overjet on the bicuspids on the left side and maybe a little bit of excess over on the right side. So in this photo with the veneers removed, it does look like a functional shift. So now I have upper midline aligned with the face, lower midline shifted off to her left. 
I have more class two on the side of the shift and I have insufficient overjet compared to the other side on the side of the shift. So now everything is starting to really indicate a functional shift. Okay. What could I do to confirm that? Well, I could do a frontal Ceph and trace it, which was not done in this case. Or I could put the patient in a flat plane splint, come back in two to three weeks, three to four weeks, and then see if the lower midline has lined up with the upper because now I've eliminated the occlusion. But it was I, assumed. Yeah, go ahead. I'd just like to add one little thing here. Do you see the inclination difference between the upper right canine and the upper left canine? So the upper right canine looks like it's tipped lingually. Lingually. And can you imagine that that is pushing the jaw to the left? Yeah. So either that's pushing it to the left or because she's shifting to the left because of some other problem, then this canine has, you know, by the pressure of the lip or the way it erupted, it could have erupted in that and basically locked it into that shifted position, right? Right. So, so these differences in torque, right versus left side, one side is lingually inclined, maybe one side is, is uh, caved in or something. There's so many ways that you could make somebody not want to bite down in the center. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> that is a challenge sometimes to find it. It could even be, it, it, it could even be this rotation. Here, you see how 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 you have have a canine rotation bodied against the lower canine. Mm -hmm. They do support in that back. So this rotated upper right canine could be having a, a occlusal interference here with the lower that's causing the jaw to shift that direction away from it. Right. There's yep. so many different ways like that. Um, the, you know, the most the most common one is the lower lower second molar on on the class two side and i think that has to do with uh the eruption pattern since lower second molar is about the last one that you know that could come in but the upper second molar isn't in yet and then and then it keeps erupting at a at an angle and uh so that is very common as you can see in this case but there's also these inclinations and it, almost every case is different yeah. And again, it's like, which came first, the chicken or the egg, right? Like, did this erupt like that because it was already shifting because of some other problem? Or did this cause it and everything else kind of took shape around that? Like, it's it's hard to know exactly what was the thing that caused it. But we do know that something has caused it and everything else is wrapped around it, right? So it's kind of locked into that shifted position. So... That's a really good point. Thanks, Don. And I did, I encourage, I'm encouraging Don to chime in. We're really lucky to have him with us. Um, you know, the, the the master himself sitting here with us. And um, this was a case that he put a lot of thought into. And so any comments or insight that you have, Don, I, I think we're all going to appreciate that. So then he's also pointing out here, guys, you know, that again, going and adjusting an irregularly worn um, incisal edge before you take the scan so now these veneers have been removed and but look at how clean this incisal edge is on the upper right one but the upper left one has some irregular wear so smoothing those out is going to make it so that the technician can line it up properly and you're either going to have to smooth it out at the beginning or at the end or maybe even a little bit of both but the more you can do these adjustments before you start see this incisal edge that's worn irregularly the more that you can create a nice flat incisal edge that is perpendicular to the long axis of the tooth, the easier it is for the technician to line everything up and give you a good result. You know, if you have a canine that's worn irregularly and has a peak sticking up, you can kind of smooth that off and make everything look symmetrical left versus right. Okay, so this is our case. She has crowding upper. Upper incisors are tipped lingually. We have close to a class one, but there's a couple one to two millimeters of class two on the right side. We have a lot of class two on the left side. We have a suspect, suspected functional shift of the mandible. Her mandible is shifting off to her left side, causing this difference. We've got, what do we have in the upper? Maybe one, two, three, four, five, six millimeters of crowding in the upper. And maybe three in the lower. Okay, how am I estimating that? I'm looking at broken contacts from the mesial of the six to the mesial of the six. And large contacts, I'm giving more 
a priority to and very small broken contacts I'm giving less of priority to. So we know that there's already excess anterior overjet, but when we align the upper teeth, we're going to end up with more, which is consistent with all this dental class too. Okay, so if we keep this functional shift and we just align the teeth, we're going to have excess anterior overjet. One of the interesting things, though, that you'll see is sometimes, see how retroclined these upper centrals are, especially the upper right central? You can see that upper right central almost locking the mandible back. So sometimes when we align these upper teeth and we get rid of this tip back upper incisor, it frees up the mandible to come forward from this you know, position where it's being rotated and shoved back on one side. And we can actually get some class two correction without doing anything to correct the class two besides aligning the teeth. And the mandible goes, ah, oh, I'm really, it has this release because it's been jammed and locked backwards and it just relaxes more into a better, you know, more spaced out position, more relaxed position in the joint. And all of a sudden some of the dental class two has gone away. Okay, so suspected functional shift, we have symmetrical arches. Um, we're looking at, we'll, we have some more pictures here in a minute, but we're looking at this collision in the front. We're looking at that collision that we pointed out in the canine. We're looking at this collision of the mesial of the distal buccal cusp of the, what is that, the three seven compared to some of these distal inclined planes in the upper and everything is locked together. Pretty low sinus, by the way, in that upper left side. You know, if you were trying to distalize, you might get some resistance from that. Eh, it's a moderately low sinus, but something to look at. Here's our CEREC scan to start. So Dr. McGann has his VIP doctor send him whatever scan they have, and he loads it up into the MetaLink viewer and, uh, and looks at it and evaluates it in three dimension, which is a really nice tool to be able to have. So you can see we have some dental deep bite not severe, but definitely have some dental deep bite. Um, she had a little bit of excess gingival display. So going back and looking here at her gingival display, we would like to probably intrude those upper centrals kind of more to the level of the laterals to get rid of that gingival display. Okay, so looking at this, we'd probably like to see the uppers intruded. Okay, more to the level of the canines and up towards those laterals. We're going to want to level. Let's go to the leveling here real quick. Then we'll come back. We're going to want to level the curve of speed. Okay, in both arches. So you can see in the lower arch to level the curve of speed. Okay, our occlusal plane is determined by the... Don, I don't remember. It's the distal buccal cusp, right? Distal buccal cusp of the lower first molar and the buccal cusp of the lower first bicuspid. Yeah. Okay? And you can see that the lower second molar, especially that distal buccal cusp because of the mesial root tip or the mesial crown tip, usually what needs to happen to level these out with aligners is we have to intrude the distal, so distal down or mesial root tip in order to level that in the back. And then we have to do intrusion in the front to align that curve of speed, okay? And on younger patients, I like to allow them to extrude the bicuspids and molars, okay? So like a younger growing teenager, somebody who's got some eruption potential and they're growing, I like to allow them to extrude those teeth to help level this plane. In the upper, you can see the occlusal plane and you can see those central incisors extend well below that occlusal plane. So that also says that we want to intrude those upper incisors to try to be, you know, more in line with the occlusal plane. So let's go back. Looking at the lingual view. You now, this is something that I didn't do a lot of, but Don has uh, encouraged me and I'm seeing more and more value and really looking at the occlusion from the lingual view. When you look at it from the lingual view, you can see that over here on the patient's right side, um, it does look like a class one occlusion. The way that the molar, the upper first molar is occluding with the lower first molar, it does look like a class one molar relationship. Okay, that distal 
palatal cusp is right in between those two molars and that mesial palatal cusp is right down in the central fossa. But over on the left side, it's not that way. We have class two on that side and we can see that the way that the inclined planes are lining up is encouraging that mandible to shift backwards on that side. So that mesial inclined plane on those lowers is wanting to bring that mandible back so that everything can interdigitate. And the same thing from the buckle. So both from the lingual and from the buckle, you have distal inclined planes in the upper and mesial inclined planes on the lower that are basically having a, a premature contacts or a traumatic occlusion if they bite in centric relation. And so centric occlusion has become one with the mandible shifted back to try to get everything to interdigitate. interdigitate. Here's the starting contact. So using the contact tool, it will show you where all of your occlusal contacts are. And you can see those um, contacts on the mesial, on these mesial parts of the lower, on that left side, like we've been pointing out. And then in his first setup, you can see the change to the uh, the contacts. Now, this isn't going to be what you're going to get because you're going to have to go do, you know, liners don't move the teeth exactly the way you see in the setup. So just because you see these contacts, when I'm on doing my first setup, it's interesting, but I don't really pay too much attention on that initial setup, unless it's a case I think is going to just use one set of aligners, which isn't that many. Um, I usually plan on doing revision or refinement on most cases. It's in the revision and refinement stages when I'm getting close to the end and my movements are now becoming very little fine tuning that I really start to look at the occlusion to get that dialed in well. But at the beginning, there's so much that's going to move between now and then, things that are going to track well with the aligners, things that aren't, that really... This is interesting and nice to see, but I don't anticipate that that's really what I'm going to have by the time I'm done with my first set of aligners. Okay, and you can also use this section tool where basically you can you can move this little plane, mesial and distal, and it will show you the cross section so you can evaluate the way that the um, the teeth are occluding in this cross sectional tool. Lots of tools to play with as you go through and evaluate your setups. Okay, so we're intruding lower sevens, intruding lower incisors, we're intruding upper incisors to try to level the curves with the occlusal plane. Uh, Don did a modified um, lateral ceph tracing in order to produce the VTO. So he did two millimeters of upper incisor intrusion. So he took the lateral ceph and actually manually moved the upper incisor up two millimeters for planned two millimeters of intrusion. And that's what helped to give the, the VTO that he got. And then he also added four millimeters of IPR in the upper. How did he do that? He took this point, you can pick any point, but he took this point on the one, two and moved it four millimeters. And you can do two millimeters on one tooth, two millimeters on another. It doesn't really matter. The, the smile stream is just looking at the total amount of crowding. So he basically removed four millimeters of tooth mass from the upper. Okay. And then in the lower, we're moving the mesial points of lower sixes forward for the class two correction and coming up with a VTO that has some expansion, okay, because he used a non-extraction ovoid number one wire. I know this is a lot of stuff to throw at you, but this is working in SmileStream and DentalCAD, manipulating the model, changing the, the wire chosen to give us expansion, okay, changing the points to give us some IPR, changing the starting position of the incisor to give us intrusion, and producing a VTO that says basically the upper incisor is going to finish where it started but intruded and the lower incisor is going to procline forward from the class two to a class one position. He provides his um, mentorees with a backup IP appliance plan. So the exit plan in case the patient's not wearing the aligners, in case things aren't tracking, in case we just need a way to get out of the case. So he diagnoses um, 
or prescribes the proper IP appliance. Okay, so that anything that the aligners don't correct that they want to fully correct, for example, the more severe rotations, the deep bite, the dental class two, the functional shift, whatever we're not being able to correct with aligners, or maybe the patient's just not wearing it, we have a plan to get out. Okay, so here's his diagnosis for the IP appliance, incisor torque, cuspid torque, molar buckle tubes, rotations, positioning, arch wire chosen. Okay, all of that is a backup plan in case we need to get brackets on to finish up the case. I uh, gave Dr. Galletly some instructions on angulations based on the panoramic x-ray as far as how to bond the brackets. You know, something to kind of follow and say, all right, bond the brackets perpendicular or parallel to these lines. Flame the ends so that you can bend the wire so they don't pull out. And give her all kinds of instructions. Provided her wording at the consultation. I have I have an 18 to 20 more 24 month plan using progressive aligners. All of the details of the case. How long is it going to take? How much it's going to cost? Okay so that you can have this consultation with your patient and present the case. And then just in case you wondered, um, we do have a consent form, a progressive aligner consent form. Where you find that is at the doctor portal login page. So if, you, if you're already in progressive aligners portal, just log out of it or go to progressivealigners.com and click on doctor portal and it will take you to this page before you log in. And there's a link to the informed consent. You can download that as a PDF and just have those in your practice to be able to have your patient sign. Okay, we've already discussed this. Um, ideal before you scan to idealize the tooth anatomy. Okay, have a couple of occlusal adjustment appointments. That would be ideal to try to get rid of the functional shift as much as possible. And if you do adjustments, you have to retake the scan, retake the photos so that they are um, consistent with what you've actually done in the mouth. Okay, you want your aligners to perfectly fit your teeth the way they are today, not the way they were before you did your adjustments. Because ideal fitting aligners move teeth much better than poorly fitting aligners. So the unlimited product was chosen. And here are the instructions that were given. And this is the one to really take note of because this is what's unique. Okay, rather than saying, yeah, let's go ahead and do unilateral distillation to fix the class two on the one side, or rather than doing a whole bunch of, of class two correction on the one side unilaterally, or instead of extracting unilaterally or doing a bunch of IPR unilaterally, he said, the upper midline is centered and the bite is shifted to the left due to occlusal interferences. Do not center the lower midline by dental shifting. He said, don't just shift all the teeth around to the upper. He goes, you need a hinge axis rotation. And most aligner companies would have no idea what you're talking about. But fortunately, the technicians, the stagers with progressive aligners actually have enough education and understanding to know what in the world he's even talking about here need a hinge axis rotation of the mandible to center the midlines. So then the technician goes, oh, okay, I'm gonna take the mandible and I'm gonna do a jump to simulate this hinge axis rotation, okay? And I'm gonna take the lower midline and I'm gonna do this hinge axis rotation until the lower midline matches the upper. And that is something that the aligners will not produce, but I'm going to make all the teeth aligned so that it fits that corrected position. Okay, then as the doctor, I'm going to have to apply some extra forces to encourage the jaw back into that position, which we'll talk about in a minute. But this was the key point and why the case came out so well is because Dr. McGann effectively communicated with the technician about how we want to fix the dental class two on one side, on the left side, and the fact that the midlines aren't centered. Okay, he's like, don't shift everything around. Just do a hinge axis rotation, line them up. That's the position I want to fix the teeth in. Okay, that was a huge thing in this case. And then the other things are things that we would have said in a lot of cases. So level the upper and the lower dental arches, especially adding mesial root torque 
or distal down to the 3, 7. Okay, because we suspect that that lower left seven is likely the cause. It's that that is likely or possibly the thing that's causing the mandible shift. Okay, so then he determined I want an endpoint of two millimeters overbite. So I want you to correct the overbite to two millimeters. Okay, so he's saying level the dental arches. So you're going to be intruding the upper and lower incisors until I have only two millimeters of overbite. And I want you to really intrude the distal of that lower left seven to level the curve of speed because that's probably where the shift is coming from he says expand two millimeters per side to the lower posterior teeth and then synchronize the upper to the lower do not distalize and that was because the patient did not want the teeth to go forward okay she said the protrusion was good just don't go any further forward so there's some expansion going on to get rid of the crowding without pushing the teeth forward. Do not distalize the upper, okay? Because the tendency would be for this technician to go, well, okay, I gotta get rid of the class two on the upper left side, so maybe I'll distalize that upper left side. Okay, he goes, don't do that. Class two elastics will be applied from the three six or the lower left six to the two three or the upper left canine. I'll show you a picture in a second. After the rotations are nearly corrected, the 3-7 is leveled and anterior overjet is present. Okay, so he's basically telling the technician when he wants the elastics to start. And then he's going to check that in the setup. Make button cutouts to support the anterior cross elastic from the upper right canine to the lower left canine. I'm going to show you that in a picture in a second. Place IPR as needed for my ideal overjet. Remember, there was a Bolton discrepancy. There's too much mass in the upper, so we already know some IPR is going to be needed in the upper to idealize the overjet. Because otherwise, we would have asked for no IPR, which is typically what we do. He indicated which teeth had more severe rotations that he would like a four-degree overcorrection and requested all attachments with gingival bevels. Okay, so remember, there's going to be a functional shift jump that we talked about when we look at the setup, where the technician is going to rotate the mandible hinge axis rotation to align the lower midline to the upper. And that's what was key in this case. So let me play um, just a screen recording that I took of the, um, of the setup. I've removed the attachments so that you're not distracted by all this stuff and you can actually see this jump happening here. Okay. So here's that key tooth tool down here. And that's turned on because this tooth movement table is activated. So if I click on a certain tooth, it would show me all the different movements down here. But let me just play this for you. Okay. So what do we see looking at it from the front? See that little jump at the end? That's the little hinge axis rotation. Okay, that's not an actual aligner. That's just a final position to show you how the teeth would align if we actually got that jump. If we actually got that jaw to stop shifting. Okay, so there's the jump. Not much is happening on the right side because the right side is already pretty close to class one. So the jump is not real obvious on the right side, but wait till you see it from the left side. See that distal buckle cusp, how sharp it is sticking up there. You can see why that would be an interference. So we're pushing that down really hard. And then when the jump is applied at the end, you see that jump? It basically goes from a full class two to a full class one. And you go, is that realistic? Well. Let's see how the play the, it plays out. That would not be very realistic to have happen if you just were, if you didn't have a functional shift of the mandible, you're not going to see that much change just by wearing elastics. But because her jaw was shifting because of her bite, it actually did play out really well that as we got rid of the um, interferences, her mandible actually did shift significantly back to where the class two became um, essentially corrected on that side. We'll see that play out. So looking from the occlusal view, here's the jump. So it's a hinge axis rotation. It's hinging around the back of the lower right side and the lower left side is rotating outward. That's the shift. 
Okay, see that shift at the end? Again, that's not an aligner doing that. That's just simulating a position that says, hey, if you think this is what's happening, then this is what it would look like if the patient stopped doing that. Okay. So here's looking at the occlusal from the upper. Okay. The other things that are happening are pretty straightforward. We're seeing the, the expansion being applied. We're seeing the upper anterior teeth being aligned. You can see that there's no actual distalization happening of the upper teeth. Okay, there's no jump. When I go back and forth on this jump, there's no jump happening in the upper because the, the upper doesn't have any type of a simulation. Let's look at it from this overjet view. Okay, everything's being pushed out, expanded out until it's aligned. And then here's that jump. Okay, is that going to happen? Well, if the patient has a functional shift, then that's going to happen. If the patient doesn't have a functional shift and it's just actual like skeletal asymmetry, their mandible is asymmetrical, then that's not going to happen. Okay. So we have enough evidence and assume that this is going to happen, but it's just a simulation. It's just a simulated jump, but we've made all the teeth align in that position so that if the patient actually has that shift and we put some elastics in the mouth to encourage it to go away and we make all the teeth line up in this simulated position, then she actually may find that this bite works really well for her jaw. Okay. And we're going to encourage that. Yeah, you can see the intrusion being applied to the upper. We intruded the upper to the, to the, the laterals. Okay. So here's what we're talking about with the elastics. Here's the different scenarios of what you could do with elastics in this case based on the setup, okay? But I want to think through this together. If I request, this is a button cutout, okay? Basically, the aligner gets trimmed with this shape so that you can bond a button onto the tooth. And if I run an elastic on the left side, that's going to pull the jaw towards correcting the shift that we're suspecting. And it's going to help fix the class two on that side. So I like, I like this setup for this elastic. Okay. On the right side, there's a little bit of class two, but if I apply the button cutouts and I apply the elastic, now I'm encouraging the mandible to shift around to the right side, which it's fighting against what I'm trying to accomplish. So even though there's a little bit of class two on that side, I'm not going to run this elastic. Okay, so I'm not going to request this cutout on the lower right because I don't want this force. I don't want to be pushing the jaw around to the patient's left side when I want the patient's jaw to go to her right side. If I look at the elastic from the front, this crotch, cross arch elastic, so from the upper right canine to the lower left canine, what am I doing? I'm encouraging the jaw to shift back around to the patient's right. So I'm taking this lower midline and I'm moving it towards the upper and I'm taking this class two side and I'm moving it towards class one. So I like the anterior cross arch elastic and the class two elastic on the left side. And this is what Dr. McGann um, diagnosed and requested as far as cutouts and what um, Dr. Galletly actually applied on the patient, okay? So these two configurations are helping with the class two correction on the left, centering the midline, getting rid of the functional shift. So again, the aligner setup is aligning the teeth in a way that if we can get this shift to go away and this jump to happen, her teeth will fit together, but nothing is actually happening in the aligners to encourage that. So we're adding these elastics as additional auxiliary forces to try to get the jaw to adopt this new position. It's actually a better position for the jaw if her jaw is getting cranked around to the left side because of her bite. Okay. And then the only thing you have to watch out for is, is, is this force compressing the teeth inside the aligner to where it's causing little binding that's keeping my rotations from correcting. So if I'm seeing any rotation corrections not happening, then I'm going to discontinue the elastic until I get it back on track. Okay. And I'm not going to apply these elastics until the stage where there's enough overjet. Let's go back and see where that is, actually.
Got to get rid of my pen. Here we go. Okay, so slide it around to the lateral view. Okay, at what aligner do I actually have my front teeth out far enough to create some overjet? It looks like it's maybe around aligner 10 or 11. Let's look from the right side or from the left side. Let's see right here. Okay, there's no there's no overjet until I get around a liner number, yeah, 10 or 11. Okay, so somewhere around a liner 10, 11, I've got enough overjet to possibly start um, some elastics. Okay, so you can see that right around a liner number 10, there's an event that happens right here, and that's where the button cutout starts. Let's look from the occlusal view. I want to look at the maxillary occlusal view. Where does the rotation of the canine look like it's corrected enough to where I could get that elastic in? Again, somewhere around aligner number 10. Okay, so probably in this case, we're going to go, hey, let's start wearing the elastics around aligner number 10. Okay, but I think actually what happened in this case is they were applied earlier and there was some loss of tracking, but also we saw a pretty early correction to that, that shift, which we'll see in a minute here. Okay, so here's some screenshots of the superimposition tool. So you can see that what was added in the upper was basically the upper laterals finished at about the vertical position where they started, but the upper centrals moved away from the starting position. So intrusion has been applied to the upper centrals, and intrusion has been applied to the lower anterior teeth, and intrusion has been applied to the lower sevens, okay? It's exactly what we talked about before. So in order to level the curve of speed and get us a nice flat occlusal plane so that we can get rid of this shift, you can see the intrusion on especially the distal of the lower left second molar, but intrusion on the other lower second molar as well, and intrusion across those lower anterior teeth and intrusion of the upper centrals. And also look at the buccal crown torque of 1-3, the upper right canine, which was, remember, that was that was lingually inclined. Mm -hmm. and, um, if you go back one slide and you look at that from the front, that needed to be done to allow the shift of the mandible. Yeah, because that was sitting here, tipped to the lingual, and for this mandible to come around, we got to get rid of that interference right there right so let's look at what you did from the occlusal view so play it yeah i gotta play it hang on play it on that view see that buckle crown torque okay right there you have more horizontal overjet on the on the right side and that allows for the shift yep. so when you're looking about when to use the elastic that would you know, make sure that there's like clearance for it to shift to the right. Yeah, which again looks like we're at around a liner number seven by the time we have room for that. So somewhere around a liner eight, nine, ten, it seems like everything's set up pretty well to start using those elastics. All right. Thanks for that. Appreciate that. Okay, so there's a lot going into this case. Okay, here's the attachments. See, there's a lot of attachments here but this was using the scallop trim. And so it's flexible. It's easy to get the aligner in and out with all these attachments. Okay, so are we getting pure intrusion or are we getting relative intrusion? You watch the upper. It looks like a combination of both there to me because I can see that the, the inclination is changing. So those Teeth that have a lingually tipped crown is getting tipped out to the buckle. And that's relative intrusion. But then also the amount of change, there's got to also be pure intrusion programmed into that. And so when we look at it from the front here, there's a change in the incisal edge position. And I think part of that is from pure intrusion. And part of that is from relative based on the lingual tipping of those teeth to start. And then the buckle crown torque being applied to those teeth. 
in the lower. Okay, here's the start up here, and here's the finish. And it doesn't look like we're applying any buckle crown tipping. It looks like pure intrusion to me in the lower. And what we end up getting, we'll see later when we look at Ceph overlays, is actually more relative intrusion of the lower. But what we applied looks more like pure intrusion of the lower. And it's really cool. This case has a lot of Ceph overlays that we get to look at, which is the progressive way. It's the Ben's Don, Don's way of teaching us all along because, you know, just because we think something is going to happen one way or we've programmed the aligners to do a certain thing, it doesn't mean that's what's going to happen. Okay. There's a lot of different things, a lot of different forces, a lot of different biomechanics at play here. And what actually happens is what we care about. And so we don't really know. And even just looking at the before and after, you don't really know what happened until you see those Ceph overlays. And so they're very interesting to look at. And we appreciate Don spending the time to do that on these cases. Here's a lingual view. Okay, so you can see that intrusion. See the upper lower intrusion. From the lingual side, you can see more of the pure intrusion on the upper. There's a little bit of it, but then a lot of that intrusion in the upper is coming from a change to the inclination of the teeth. If you watch these upper molars, you can see the labial root torque being applied. So here's the starting position. So if you watch this upper right molar and you kind of keep an eye on the torque of the crown and the way that the gingiva is being simulated, you can see that there's labial root torque being applied because that torque changes as they expand outward. And there's proper overjet being created to allow this jump at the end. This is a screenshot of the staging tool. Okay, so you can see that all of the blue aligners are active aligners. So basically every tooth from one seven, through the two seven and the four seven through the three seven, every tooth is basically moving in every stage. Okay, so they're all very small movements and everything is moving. You can see where the uh, attachments are going on. Attachments went on at stage three. You can see where IPR is being applied. You can see where this jump is at the end, the virtual jump, and you can see it's only on the mandible, not on the maxilla. Okay, so that's what got put in the patient's mouth. And here we are uh, with a progress check at stage 12, a liner number 12 of the first series of 20. Okay, so the first series was 20 aligners, and here we are at six months of treatment, stage 12, which means the patient's wearing these aligners and changing them every two weeks. Remember the protocol is two weeks if you want Sorry, my throat is getting so dry. Two weeks would be the longest amount of time, okay? Um, I would start with my patients at two weeks, and if I'm getting good tracking within the first couple months, I would probably go to 10 days and then seven days if everything continues to track well, okay? Our protocols are set up with progressive aligners to say if the patient is wearing the aligners well, if their teeth are moving well, and their patient's wearing the aligners 22 hours a day, you should be able to change every week. Okay, but if the teeth are not moving into the aligner, if they're not tracking well, then we're going to want to slow that down to every 10 days or every 14 days. But really, what really counts is have the teeth moved into the aligner is are there no gaps between the teeth and the edges of the aligners? And does the aligner feel passive? That's the right time to move on to the next tray. We want to get all the ingredients out of the existing one. We want all the movements to express in the one that we're in. So minimum of seven, maximum of 14, okay? But somewhere in that range, you're gonna get to the point where the teeth look like they fit perfectly into the aligner and the, the aligner feels passive. And if you can train your patient on that, then it becomes you are the advisor, you're advising them how to get their teeth straight, but they're responsible to get their teeth straight. They have to wear their aligner, they have to use the chewies, they have to be doing what you're asking them to do and not moving on to the next aligner until the teeth have fully expressed in the current one, okay? 
Pretty soon we'll have dental monitoring available um, at a price that works for the GP. Uh, you guys will get all the details on that soon, but that's another way to decide when to uh, move to the next aligner would be when the dental monitoring says, ah, the AI has evaluated this scan and all the teeth have moved into the aligner appropriately. It's time to move on to the next one. Or the teeth have all not all moved in, no go, stay in this aligner longer. Okay. So at this point though, stage 12, six months of treatment, they're moving at uh, an aligner change of every two weeks. And what do we see? What's changed? Well, the lower dental midline is a lot closer to the upper. We have tipped that crown of that upper right canine out to the buckle. It looks like it has better overjet to allow this uh, to start shifting, the mandible to start shifting over. Um, there's been some correction of the upper centrals. They're not as retroclined. They look like they're in better alignment with the uppers, although there's still a ways to go. But what's really interesting to me is the change in the occlusion. And you know, it looks like we're still at or close to the class one on the right side. And on the left side, there's been an obvious change to that occlusion. I'll show you, well, here, we'll look at this and then we'll go on to the next set where you can really see it. Um, here's the start. Here's where we are at six months. So you can see, again, that's a pretty marked difference to those anterior teeth. So there's definitely been proclination of those upper centrals. But what we'll find when we look at the overlays is you would think it's just proclination of the upper incisors, but actually it's a lot of retroclination of those upper laterals. So instead of, it seems like it's just the centrals getting pushed out towards the laterals. When you wear the aligner with the forces, it's actually also pushing inwards on the laterals and they're retroclining and the, towards the centrals. But they're getting aligned, okay? And the lower teeth are getting aligned. So this was just a progress check, stage 12, six months. Now we look at the case after the first set of trays is done. So 20 stages, 10 months, and now it's time to do a revision refinement, take what we got and keep on working. So pretty significant change to her smile. I mean, she's really happy at this point already at 10 months in compared to what she started with. If you think back, she had those ugly composite veneers on those front teeth, upper laterals were super flared out. Those upper centrals looked really tipped back, but look at those midlines. So look at how her lower dental midline looks like she's comfortably got it centered with the upper. There's your start to end of series one, end of the first set of aligners, significant progress. But what's really marked is that shift of that lower dental midline, which started out here over to be aligned with the upper. You can see the upper hasn't changed. It's still in the same position as the face. She has better alignment of upper teeth, but that midline hasn't changed positions. Okay, it's in the same position, but her mandible is no longer shifting off to her left side. It's now centered, which is amazing. Okay, and if we hadn't have given the correct instructions for this hinge axis rotation and applied the correct auxiliary forces, remember we've got class two elastics going on her left side, and then we've got cross arch elastics going upper right canine to lower left canine. And all of that is encouraging this jaw to get rid of the shift as we're making room for that to happen by aligning the, the teeth properly. Okay, here's a pano at the end of this series. You can see that we still have this mesial crown tip. So we're gonna continue trying to add mesial root tipping or distal down, but that's really dense bone back here. You know, it's hard to get that intrusion. It's right in the elbow of the jaw. It would be easier to pick up a handpiece and grind that away, right? But it is nice, and you're going to do everything you can with the aligner to try to get this tooth more upright to get rid of that occlusal interference if that's where it's coming from. So you can see this is the powder from the scan. That's why the tissue and the teeth look like this. There's still powder from the scan. But here we go start versus the end of the first series at 10 months. And you can see that lower midline shifted from here to here and significant alignment of the front teeth. Look at the change in the torque of that upper right 
canine. I didn't draw that very well, but there's that lingual crown torque compared to a nice alignment. And that's allowing the jaw to shift over without banging into that canine. And then these tip back teeth moving forward is allowing the jaw to come forward as it rotates around. So let's see the posterior occlusion. Look at that change. Okay, we still have a nice leaner digitated, very, very close to class one on the right, just like we started with. But the left, look at that canine relationship at the start versus where we are now at 10 months. That is significant. And that's not just coming from wearing class two elastics, um, you know, and having in mass dental alveolar or, um, yeah, in mass dental alveolar movement. This is coming from the mandible shifting because that's the only way you're going to get that significant of a change. Let's look at it in the models. You can see the start versus the finish here, or not finish at 10 months. So look at the position of this mesial buccal cusp of this upper right. I'm sorry, upper left first molar, this two seven two six, And look at the position here at 10 months. It went from here to here. And that didn't happen. That's not what you're going to see from wearing class two elastics and dragging the teeth through the bone. There may have been a little bit, maybe a millimeter of dragging teeth through bone, but this is coming from the whole mandible shifting. There's, it's the only way you're going to get that market of a change in 10 months. Because it's a significant shift. Look where that distal is in relation to where we want it, touching the mesial of that lower seven. That's a huge change. Okay, so that's correct diagnosis, correct communication with the technician, a correct setup, and then correct application of the auxiliary forces is what it took to get this kind of a just outstanding correction at 10 months. Okay, versus, oh, let's pull out this upper left bicuspid so that we can move this canine back into class one. Okay, that would have shifted the upper dental midline off to the patient's left and created dental asymmetry. And this is a mistake that orthodontists would have made. Yeah, you can see we're still not quite centered. The lower midline is still not quite centered with the upper, but it's gotten a lot closer. And we're not quite class one on that left side, but we're gotten a lot closer. And you can see now that there's actually overjet to continue to bring this forward. Okay, see this rotation is not all the way corrected yet, and there still may be a little collision right here that's preventing that from fully coming over. So in the revision, we're going to continue to align things to allow this complete functional shift to correct. So here's the end of the first set of aligners that the 10 month comparison. And here's a start versus the end of the first uh, series Ceph so that we can do an overlay. Now you can definitely see a change in the overjet. It's been a huge reduction in overjet. Interestingly, her upper lip has actually come back a little bit. And that's because those upper laterals that were kind of flared, they actually weren't flared. They were actually at an ideal inclination. It's just that the upper centrals were very retroclined. But rather than completely proclining the upper centrals out to the laterals, what's happened is the upper laterals have actually pushed back towards the centrals. And so that lip has actually come back a bit. But let's look at the overlay. So this is called a skeletal overlay, the SN line at S. So here's Sella. So this is S and here's the nasion point. So the SN line goes from cella to nasion and we line that up on both of the cephs and look at the skeletal changes. And the maxilla is still in the same place and the mandible has come forward by a millimeter, millimeter and a half, something like that. And this is a non-growing patient. So how did that happen? How did the mandible come forward? Well, this is evidence that it was locked into a retruded position, shifted off to one side. And as we've aligned the teeth and opened up and created overjet, 
and then applied the proper auxiliary forces, we've encouraged the mandible into a better position in the jaw joints. And that's a more forward position. And it's no longer locked into a retruded, shifted position. So it's very cool to actually see in an overlay the actual change in the position of the mandible. And then here's the dental overlay, okay? So when we do a dental overlay, we're overlaying the maxilla from the start to the finish and the mandible from the start to the finish. So lining up the bones to see what happened to the teeth. And what happened to the teeth was a slight change to the upper molar, came forward just a little bit. In the upper uh, incisor, it looks like there's been intrusion, but it also looks like the tooth has had some labial root torque and how we didn't add labial root torque to the setup. So how could that have happened? Well, as we're applying pure intrusion and pushing on this tooth, what's feeling more of that intrusive force is the lingual towards the gum line of that upper incisor, which would make the root move to the labial. Okay, so pure intrusive force on this tooth, given its inclination, is actually causing some labial root torque, even though that wasn't programmed into the aligner. That's exactly right. And it's different than if you're applying an intrusion force with a bracket on the facial surface of the tooth, where that's gonna, gonna add to the to the lingual movement of the root apex. If you're pushing on the cingulum, then you get the labial um, labial root. So if it movement. So if you want to counter that, you ask for lingual root torque on the upper incisor that's being intruded in the setup. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's mm -hmm. that's really uh, you know getting into the advanced mechanics of of aligners when you see this right here, and it explains. You you said it exactly right. It's the force on the cingulum that's causing that. Yeah. It's the force on the cingulum. Thanks, Don. And they also have, if you look at some of the setups, sometimes you'll see a tooth come back, like in the lower, you'll see this blue line. They'll have this blue line that goes over the top of the tooth onto the lingual. And you're like, what is that blue line? But these are intrusion ridges. And so sometimes they'll try, and you can ask, you can request these. But if I was to put an intrusion ridge, it would make the force, the positive force be applied onto a different part of the tooth than where it would otherwise fall. And so you can ask for intrusion ridges to the aligner, which will change where that force lands on the tooth. And we can say, you know, we specifically want it on the incisal edge and a little bit over here on the facial rather than landing on that cingulum. So those are other things that we could play with and then do overlays and see if that made a difference or not. So we have a lot a lot to learn in these as well. The lower incisor has proclined forward. Okay, around the center of resistance, we've had crown tipping forward. And remember, we didn't actually have a lot of um, proclination uh, planned. It, when we looked at that um, the movie in a lateral view, it looked like pure intrusion was happening. But on this one, when you push straight down on it, it's also feeling it on the lingual side. And so that's causing some buccal crown tipping, I'm assuming on this one. But interesting to see. And then we have had advancement of the molar. So not only is the class two elastic advanced the mandibles we saw in the previous overlay, but there has been dental alveolar advancement of the teeth. And that may also be why we've seen some tipping of the lower incisors because of the dental alveolar advancement from the class two elastic. So here is the revision setup. Let me just play this for you. Oops. Trying to get rid of my pen. There we go. Okay. So revision setup. First of all, if you watch that canine on the lower left side, right here, there is a lot of root movement happening there. So I'd probably really evaluate that and go, is that very predictable? Is it necessary? Is it helping us? 
you know, if we really need it, then I would leave it. But if I don't see a need for it, I'd say that's just somewhere where I might lose tracking and I might reduce the amount of uh, root movement being applied to that tooth. Okay. What else is happening in this setup? There's continued intrusion being applied to the upper incisors. There's lingual root torque being applied to that upper right canine. And then just general alignment of the teeth. Okay, let's look at it from the lateral view. What are we seeing going on over here? Well, now we actually are doing something with the aligner to correct some dental class too. Do you see how the upper second molar is actually having the crown tipping distal? Okay, when you actually look at those molars, they actually do look like they have some mesial crown tip. So we can continue to correct some dental class too by this sequential distal crown tipping and then kind of some sequential distalization going on on the upper right. Okay, we'd want to reinforce that. So continue to wear class two elastics on this side to continue to encourage the, the jaw to shift and also to anchor the upper anterior teeth on the left side to the lower to help this distalization process on that side. But I wanna make sure that my upper midline is not shifting. So if I go back and look at the front teeth, do I see a midline shift up there? Mm, there's a very slight midline shift to her upper left. So I have to be aware of that and be okay with the fact that that upper midline, because of the distalization just on that upper left, that I would be okay with a little bit of a shift. It doesn't look significant enough to make it look inappropriate for her. But whenever you do unilateral distalization on an arch that's symmetrical, you're gonna get a little bit of a midline shift. Okay, what else do I see? Watch those upper anterior teeth. See how much lingual root torque is being applied? Because remember we saw in the overlay that labial root torque actually is what we got out of the first set of aligners, which is not really what was wanted. So here, there's a, a lot of lingual root torque being added to try to compensate for the aligner weakness. And also for the fact that previously we got labial root torque instead of lingual. Okay. Looking at it on the right side, no real change to the posterior occlusion because it's already at or close to class one, but you can see that lingual root, root torque being applied to the upper centrals. Okay. Oh, going back over to the left side again, watch this lower uh, second molar, um, the three seven. Remember that distal buccal cusp is still tipped up. We still have that crown tipped mesial. So if you watch the setup, see how it's still applying a lot of pressure to get the distal down on that, on that molar, on that lower left side. Okay, so we're still doing things to try to get rid of this functional shift and allow her to find a happy home with her jaw centered. Okay, so you can see at this point, they're no longer applying the jump. At this point, we've said, okay, we probably have got what we got out of the, the mandible shifting. So let's start actually moving the teeth around this new position. But see, there's no jump stage anymore. Everything is actual movement within the aligner. See that kind of distalization on the upper left? Okay. So now we're actually moving teeth around what we got from that first set where we were trying to correct that shift. Okay, see that movement of that lower second molar? I'm going kind of long here, guys, so I'm going to go through this a little bit faster here. So this set of pictures was just a basically a checkup at one year. It's a one-year check. We're only two aligners into this first set of refinement. So we've gone 20 stages in the upper and 11 stages in the lower, it looks like at this point, but it's just basically a one-year check. There hasn't been much change from the previous set of records because we're basically only two aligners into the next refinement setup. 
Okay, so we're not going to spend a lot of time looking at that. But here we are at the end of this first refinement. So now we've done a first series of aligners, which took us 10 months. And now we've gone an additional 10 months with a refinement. So now we're 20 months into the case. And again, it looks like we're just progressing at two weeks per liner. Could we have gone faster? Possibly. Okay. It may be that they were just told, Dr. Gletley was just told, you know, go every two weeks. And so that's just the protocol I followed. Could it have gone faster? I'm not sure. Maybe. But the fact that we had those elastics in there for a long time has really helped. But look at this result now. The deep bite correction is looking very nice. We had and still continue to have basically the same occlusion on the right side. It's slightly class two, which is what it was to start, but it's close to class one. So we still haven't seen any real change on the right side. That's to be expected. On the left side, now that we did that little distalization, look at how good things have gotten on the left. We went from almost a full molar class two to basically class one on the left side. And what did that come from? That came from functional shift of the mandible being corrected. It came from distal crown tipping and a little bit of distalization on the upper left side. It came from wearing class two elastics on the left side. There were a lot of different things that went into that correction. But look here at these midlines now. Okay. If anything, from this angle, I'm not sure if this is just a, an angle of the photo thing, but now it looks like the upper midline is a little bit off to the left side of the lower. When it started out, the lower was like way over here. Okay, so maybe the upper midline shifted a little bit off to the left, or maybe we got more correction of the mandible shifting off to the right side or a combination of both. But look at how good the posterior horizontal overjet, it looks very symmetrical on both sides. It looks like the teeth want to fit together pretty well in this position. So this is a huge change. The patient's ready for one more refinement because there's been a little space that's opened up right in here. And just in general, there's some food getting caught. I think there's a little space over here somewhere. We'll see in a second. We still have a little bit of mesial root torque needed on the lower six and seven on the left side, you know, still try to get that mesial cusp to come up. And the four, six mesial root torque to level. So over here on the right side still could use a little bit of mesial root torquing to get that mesial buckle cusp to come up and then just generally close up some spaces. Occlusion on the left side, buckle crown torque needed in the lower molars. Okay, so we're saying on the left side, we could use a little bit of buckle crown torquing. You look at that, you say, oh, that could use these coming out a little bit to the buckle based on that overjet. Hang on, I got a somewhat urgent request here. Let me just take care of this real, real quick. All right, so here's the Medit scan, which was very helpful for Dr. McGann to be able to evaluate this in a 3D model, look at the occlusion, look at what's hitting, figure out what still needs to move to get things corrected. Okay, and then he basically starts making a finishing bends prescription as he would do with braces, you know, so really evaluating each of these teeth, saying, I want a little bit of mesial in on the upper right two. Hang on. Okay, so just minor rotations going through and saying, what little step in, step out, step up, little rotations, what would I do with a finishing wire? And whatever I would do with a finishing wire to make this look great, I'm going to ask for those little rotations to be corrected in this uh, refinement aligner to get a nice result. 
Okay, so here were the submission instructions, which we're going long, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, but just all these little details of what's needed to fine tune this case. So here is this revision. See if I can play this for you. So this is revision number two. And there's what we see happening from the front. Now pay attention to what's happening over here on the side. See the extrusion of these upper bicuspids downward and this upward rotation of these molars. So that would be like mesial root torque added. And the, let me go back and show you that again. The extrusion of this upper molar. These are a lot of unpredictable movements here. It's difficult for the aligner to do these extrusions. Okay. So if I saw this in a setup, I would be thinking, and I don't have the attachment showing here. In fact, if you really look at it, you can see that there's a lot of uh, composite kind of still left on these teeth. I don't know if the attachments were removed digitally and then they went in the uh, the clinic and removed it, or if it was removed in the clinic and just hasn't been cleaned up all the way. It looks like they were digitally removed. Okay, it's better to go and remove all of the attachments from the teeth before you um, send in for revision so they can put new attachments on. But I'm thinking in my mind, I might need some auxiliary forces to help accomplish these movements to get that posterior bite to settle like they're showing here. Okay, I see a lot of root movement on that upper canine and some rotation. So I'm going to want to make sure that that has a vertical attachment to help with that. So just some fine tuning that's happening here. On the right side, again, see that how we're kind of extruding the back teeth into occlusion. So I might need some auxiliary forces to help with that. And there's a little collision right here that we're kind of getting rid of by fixing that rotation. Let's see, sorry, going through too fast through that. So see those mesial of those canines are being rotated out to get rid of any possible interference between those teeth. But look at how good the overjet is getting at this point compared to what we had at the start. There's the view from the lingual. There's the view from the occlusal. Okay, still pushing down really hard on the distal buckle of the uh, lower left second molar. So here's what I'm thinking. I'm going to run the aligners. I'm going to have the patient use chewies and hope that everything goes the way the aligner wants, but I'm going to be prepared. I'm going to prepare myself and the uh, patient for possibly needing to add some auxiliary forces, maybe partway through the set of aligners or maybe at the end stage of these aligners to just really pull these teeth down. And so don't be afraid to go take a pair of scissors or a um, cutting burr and modify your aligner. Um, here in this picture, you can see that there were some button cutouts actually requested in this particular revision stage. But you can actually just take your final aligner and just trim it. Oops, trim it to be able to create some space to put some buttons on those teeth and then run some little box elastics because that's going to pull those teeth down. So all the movements that you were seeing to kind of place the buttons on more the mesial side of these lower molars to help those mesials come up and put some elastics and don't be afraid to add auxiliary forces. So when you look at a setup, go, hey, you know what? The aligner might struggle to do that. I'm not scared of trimming an aligner and bonding some buttons and asking the patient to wear some elastics to help guide those teeth. Now, if I just did this without the aligner in, you'd get all kinds of unwanted movements. Pulling on the buckle of the upper and the lower like this, let's say I just trimmed the aligner and this took everything off the back and put these on to settle the bite, you'd get all kinds of unwanted movement, okay? Mostly what would be lingual crown tipping because as I pull on the buckle, the buckles would come, the facial surfaces would come towards each other and the crowns would tip to the lingual. But if I trim the aligner to where I keep the occlusal, say third of the aligner, 
then I have almost like a catcher's glove to just guide that tooth into position as I apply these auxiliary forces. So it may happen with the aligner and some chewies, but it may not happen. And so if these movements to kind of settle that bite don't happen, be prepared to just modify the aligner or request some cutouts and place the buttons and have the patient wear some elastics to sock everything in. If you don't request the, the cutouts, what I would do is wear some aligners. And if I start seeing a gap between the tooth and the aligner, I know it's not tracking, then I would just cut that aligner, place the buttons, have the patient continue to wear that aligner with some elastics until the teeth get pulled into that aligner. And then however many aligners I have left in that series, I would just continue to trim them to allow these buttons to stay on and continue to have the patient wear these elastics while we sock that bite in back there. Okay. It's just auxiliary forces. It's aligners in combination with us using our brain and engineering. How can I add some additional forces to help the teeth move into this aligner? So here we are at 24 months. And I was confused with the previous one. This is when the little space opened up here between the upper right lateral and central, and there was some food getting stuck. But we're now 24 months in, which is what I would have expected with braces on this case. You know, this is a really difficult case with that much asymmetry. I'd been thrilled to be done with it in 24 months. So I would have been saying 18 to 24 months for sure. And here we are with aligners with an amazing correction and really just some refinement that needs to be done at this point. Okay, so patients up for one more set of aligner refinements. We're just going to close up some little spaces. How did that space open? I don't know if maybe she wasn't wearing the aligner as much. Maybe there was a compliance issue. Maybe because we were adding some lingual root torque, it kind of caused these teeth to flare out a little bit. Not sure exactly why that happened, but we can fix it. Okay, so here we are, start versus 24 months, significant change. Here's a new set of medit scans at 24 months. Almost looks like we maybe have had a little bit of relapse on this left side. So maybe the patient has had a little bit of a compliance issue. It's, you know, it's been a long time, maybe just getting a little bit lazy with wearing the aligners at this point. But we get her encouraged to go do one more set of aligner refinements and finish up the case. Here's what the panoramic x-ray is looking like at this point, which looks really nice. Okay, maybe we can still do a little bit of distal down mesial root tip on that molar we've been working so hard on, that um, 3.7. But really nice root alignment. Okay, Ceph overlay. This is comparing the end of the first set of aligners. So that, that was at 10 months with the end of the third set of aligners. So at the end of the second refinement, now we're at 24 months. Looking just at the Cephs, remember how hard we were applying lingual root torque to those upper incisors? Well, now it actually visually does look like that tooth is at a different inclination compared to the start. So let's see the overlay. So here's the skeletal overlay, the SN line. And again, no real change to the maxilla and that forward movement of the mandible, which again is the functional shift correcting. I don't know why we're seeing a change in the facial tissue here. Maybe just a patient was at a slightly different angle or more relaxed or tracing air, not sure. Here's the dental overlay, so overlaying the maxilla to see what happened to the teeth. Here you can see relative intrusion, okay, because the root apex looks about the same level, but we've seen lingual root torque actually be applied to that tooth. Therefore, we've gotten some buccal crown torquing, which has given us a little bit of relative intrusion. We've had a little bit of extrusion of that upper molar as they've tried to settle the bite. Lower molars continue to come forward just a little bit. Class two elastic effect or the jaw shifting around forward or a tracing. You know, it's hard to trace those molars sometimes and get on the exact same molar because they're overlapped. But look at the lower incisor. Um, continued advancement of that lower incisor. 
from class to elastics? It'd have to be because there really was no more crowding that was being resolved at that point. And here's a set of overlays showing the very start of treatment versus where we are at the end of the third series. Okay, and again, you can see the mandible has advanced. Upper molar has extruded and advanced. And I'm not sure why the upper molar would have advanced. It may be a, a tracing error. Maybe Don, you can give us some insight on that. But interesting on this one, it looks like the inclination of the upper incisor is about the same as the start and that we've had pure intrusion. I see upper molars or all the molars coming forward a little bit when you add torque to the upper incisor. Mm -hmm. And that seems to be because they are locked in with the incisors. So when you when you torque incisors, you pull the molars forward. So Good uh, point. I think I've seen that now enough times to where i don't think it's tracing there i think it's just the way that it is and i work really hard to try to get those you know the right ones but of course it's tough sometimes on the molars yeah yeah thanks don um, mandibular overlay you can see that lower incisor again we've had um basically tipping okay so the the crown has tip buckle and because of the center of rotation the um root has gone lingual so we've had some relative intrusion and some pure intrusion of that lower and some advancement of the lower molar from the class two elastic and also some intrusion of the molar because we've been trying to level that curve of speed. So one last revision, trying to close up that little space that opened between the upper right lateral and the central, uh, maybe a little IPR in there to help close that up and then just generally tightening up contact. So if you're not aware, you can request virtual chain, or we also will call this um, RSC, residual space closure, they call it. There are three aligners that we'll see that they add at the end of the setup that just basically tightens up all the contacts. It just moves all the teeth together. It'd be like doing fake IPR. It'd be like digitally doing IPR and moving all the teeth closer together and then having the patient wear you know, sometimes it just takes one. You just have to wear the first of these three aligners. Maybe you might go to the second. Very rarely do I ever go to the third one, okay? But there are three extra aligners that just tightens, tightens, and tightens so that any like contacts, anything where food might be getting stuck, it just, it's kind of like putting chain from six to six with braces, which is why we call it a virtual chain. But they call it residual space closure. Do you have a comment, Don? Yeah, uh, the, the virtual C chain is an Invisalign type of uh, wording and fake IPR, we were doing that because that was ineffective. Um, so that was, uh, but they solved it completely with this, whatever they put into their um, residual space closure, they solved it, made the whole thing simple. And I think they saw it as a problem because people didn't, didn't know what to say except tighten up the contacts. <laughs> yeah. So here at the bottom right, you can see these three kind of grayed out um, stages. Those are the residual space closure. Those are because we requested this virtual chain or this residual space closure. So you just need to know that when you look at this setup, you're only going to evaluate to here because this is really the final position. And these next two are just overcorrective that just tightens everything, pulls it all closer together. So I don't want to go to this last stage number eight and evaluate that position because that's not a real position. These are the overcorrective ones, which is why they blacked it out. So be aware of that. So you don't just hand your patient all of these extra aligners. Okay. You're going to get to the end of the actual set and then you're going to give them the first one and have them come back and check with floss. And if everything feels good, that's where you stop. If it's still light, you can go to the second one. And the third one's there for like insurance, but you're not gonna use that very often. You'd have to have some pretty big spaces to actually need that last one in my experience. So let me play this revision setup for you. Okay, at this point, just really minor movements are happening here. So I'm trying to stop at the actual last aligner stage before we go into the overcompensation. 
So see just real minor movements. I might still need some elastics in the back to settle that bite in, but it's actually looking pretty good at this point. So some rotation corrections still happening. Trying to get that bite to settle in the back. I might end up needing a vertical elastic back here to sock that in if I want it to finish like that. Looking from the occlusal, we're tightening up that space where the little space opened up and just doing some correction to the rotations. I might have overcorrected that rotation right there. Maybe that one as well. But here's the here's the overcorrective. Now I'm showing you the residual space closure. And if you look at all the teeth, they're all just moving closer together. Wait, let me go back and show it again. So watch the distance between the sevens and the ones. See how it all just gets tighter together? So that's what's happening in those last three aligners. It's just moving everything closer together as if I was doing fake IPR and just pulling it all together. Okay. Thanks. So um, same thing in the lower. Here's what's actually happening in the aligner set. A little rotation correction of that lower left canine. And then the overcorrection is just pulling it all closer together, closing up spaces. Okay, so let's see how it played out. So finished at 26 months. It's a long time, the long haul for this patient. She's ready to be done. Both patient and doctor very happy. Beautiful smile. Okay, we can we can get nitpicky, which we will a little bit, but um, just absolutely, you know, for for an aligner case, um, this is a really great result. And actually, I think, you know, maybe the, if we did braces, we would have maybe had a little better torque control of those upper incisors because they still ended up a little bit retroclined. We'll see in the uh, in the overlays at the end. Um, but gosh, to get that functional shift corrected, to get class one on both sides to get the midlines aligned, to get this nice alignment of the upper and lower arch. Um, deep bite was improved. Really just very, very, I would be very proud of this. This is a great case. Um, you know, if we got picky, we could say that that upper right um, lateral, we did get the space closed, but it still looks like it has a little mesial out rotation. And same thing with this lower left one. Compared to the start to finish, Really beautiful result. Now, when you look at her gingival display, what's interesting is it looks about the same to me in the back. When I look at the posterior segments, it looks about the same. Um, when we looked at the setups, it looked like we were going to intrude the uppers to the level of the laterals. But when you look in her mouth, it looks like the laterals more came down to the level of the centrals. And I think we'll see that in the overlays too. So even though the setups that we were showing showed the laterals staying the same and the centrals going up and proclining forward, what ended up happening is the central stayed in a similar position to where they were and the laterals came down retroclined and basically got relative extrusion. And so we have a little bit more gingival display than I would have anticipated if the upper centrals had gone up the way we asked them to. And she may be smiling a little bit higher in this picture. You can see a little bit more muscle activation on this one. Um, you can even see a little bit of a plain cant now that she smiles up, up really high. But um, gosh, a beautiful smile. You know, it's interesting to look at what actually happened to try to figure out how these aligners work and um, what actually did move. And I'm not being critical of the case because I think it's a beautiful case. And obviously the patient's very happy and should be very happy. Okay. But a little bit of overcorrection of this upper right lateral incisor and maybe those last couple of setups could have helped with that rotation correction to get that fully corrected. And maybe a little bit of overcorrection of that lower um, incisor, which I think Don was requesting, but they maybe just weren't programming into the setup. And that's where if you know how to use the 3D tools, you can really go in there and just go, hey, I'm going to manually add the amount of overcorrection that I want. Um, I found that it is hard to get the technician sometimes to add the overcorrection, but it's easy for me to go in and just dial it up. So let's look at some overlays here. 
Oh, there's the lingual view. Look at this intercuspation, this nice class one intercuspation on the left side that started out really class two. The right side always was class one, started and finished class one, but big change on that left side. You know, really got that functional shift corrected. Start versus final of the leveling. Okay, look at the, the lower arch leveled quite nicely. The upper arch, again, see how it almost looks like the central stayed about where they were and the laterals came down. So I think what happened in the upper, we see it in the overlay as well, rather than getting pure intrusion or even relative intrusion of the upper, it's almost like we got extrusion and relative extrusion of the upper laterals. Which to me is interesting because I normally am thinking extrusion is hard for the aligners to do and intrusion is a little bit easier. But because those upper ladders were sticking out like that, downward, upward pressure on the centrals, you know, equal and opposite force was downward pressure on those laterals. And it was easier for them to retrocline and get relative extrusion than it was for the centrals to get the pure intrusion that we were asking for. But really, really nice case. I mean, I would be so proud of this case. So there you can see start to finish. See the little, little under correction of that uh, distal rotation. Uh, maybe even a little bit of an under correction on both of the lateral distal rotations. But in her mouth, the upper left one actually looks really good. And the upper right one is a little bit visible. And on the lower, again, really nice correction of everything looks really good. Just that distal rotation on that lower uh, left central, the three one. So maybe a little bit of IPR to make some room and then just a three degree overcorrection there. But again, you know, as a doctor, we might see things where we're like, I want to keep going. I want to keep fixing this. And the patient's like, I've had these in for 26 months. I'm happy. I'm done. You know, I don't need anything more to be happy here. And that's when cases end is when the patient's like, I'm done. It's pretty rare for me that I get to the point where every single thing that my eye can see is done because, you know, patients get to the point where they're they're tired of it and they're happy. And that's uh, that's when it ends up finishing. So start to final panoramic X-ray, really beautiful root alignment. Let's look at some Ceph overlays start to finish. OK, so what happened here? This is where we really find out what happened in this case. So this is the start versus final. The skeletal overlay, no change to the position of the maxilla, which we wouldn't have expected the maxilla to change positions. And the mandible definitely from start to finish ended up more forward than it started, okay? At least a millimeter. And that's why we saw such a significant change to the class two, because not only did the mandible rotate, but it came forward as it rotated, okay? Because this is a non-growing patient. So the only thing that could account for that consistently on the CEPHs, we were seeing the mandible forward from the start position is the fact that the jaw is now happy in a more forward and rotated position because it was locked in a retruded and shifted position. So, you know, not only have we corrected the teeth, but we've given this patient much better function of the of the mandible. The TMJ health is going to be much better throughout the rest of her life because now the jaw is going to function symmetrically and in the proper spaces within that joint space because it's no longer getting shifted and crammed back on one side and pulled out on the other side. So to me, this is really significant. And I like seeing that in that overlay. It, it validates the fact that what we thought would happen with that functional shift did actually happen. Okay, the maxillary overlay, when we overlay the maxillary bone, we see the teeth changes. And interesting in this one, we don't see from start to finish as big of a change of the crown, maybe a little bit of a change of the root position, but only about a millimeter of actual advancement of the upper molar. And again, Don, as you were saying, maybe from, you know, trying to add lingual root torque to the upper, which gave it um, buckle crown torque, which equal opposite force pulls on those molars forward. Um, but change from start to finish of the upper incisor, we only got about half a millimeter of actual intrusion. And we actually finished with the tooth with more retroclined or, or more labial root torque than we started with. So the crown is actually almost in the same as, position as the starting, but the root is more labial. 
Okay, so actually not a huge change to that central incisor. The bigger change was from the lateral incisor coming to the position of that central. And I don't know, again, we were talking earlier about the force being applied to the cingulum as we tried to intrude those uppers, and that may have caused the root to go labial. But it's pretty interesting to see, and as Don was telling me earlier, it's tempting to want to do these overlays and try to make it line up to get the teeth to look like they moved the way you thought they were going to move or wanted them to move. But when you really line up the Ceph, it tells the real story. And that's why, you know, Don and the way that he's always taught and the way we've always taught at Progressive is like, you get the real story. You get to see what really happened. And that helps you as you go plan your cases to go, hey, I've seen this over and over and over. And even though I might want this to happen, this is what does happen. And so I can plan for that. I can um, maybe do things to overcome that. But it really is helpful to see the real story and what actually happened. In the lower, we actually saw extrusion of the molar. Okay, that could be because we were running the class two elastics on the left side, which when we run an elastic, it does have a, an upward um, vector of force in addition to a forward. And so it could have pulled that left side um, up so that when you trace the molar, it looked like it had a higher position. Or, and as we intruded the sevens, there's an equal and opposite force pushing upward on the sixes. So as we trace the sixes, that may have helped to open the bite. There actually may have been some extrusion on the sixes um, from trying to intrude the sevens. I would have expected to see some advancement of the molar from the start position, but we don't really see any there. Um, again, with the class two elastics and the shift of the mandible, I well, the functional shift of the mandible wouldn't show up in this tracing. It would only show up in this tracing. So what this is showing us is, is that there was no real dental alveolar change. We didn't actually pull the molar through the bone. Any class two correction we got came from mandible shifting and that distalization that we were doing in the aligner on the upper left side. But we didn't actually show on the CEPH that we got any real advancement of that molar. We did get a big change to the lower incisor. Okay. So that lower incisor did tip forward quite a bit, which if I would have expected to see this molar more forward in addition to that lower incisor more forward, but we got a three millimeter change from the start to the final position, um, which there wasn't that much crowding in the lower. So it's not crowding that brought that forward. It would have to be the class two elastics that we were running, but I would expect that to have also shown a molar moving forward. But it does coordinate with what we anticipated on the VTO was class two elastics, lower incisors are going to tip forward, upper incisors are going to finish about where it started. So interesting that we actually did end up getting pretty close to what the smile stream dental CAD VTO in two dimensions had predicted. Don, any thoughts or comments on these overlays, especially that lower molar um, finishing where it started? No, I think that you uh, explained it very well. All right, thank you. So again, just to revisit, start versus finish, beautiful case. I would be so thrilled with this. Dr. Galletly did a great job. I think this patient did a great job. You know, really good um, compliance wearing the aligners, really great planning. The fact that her jaw is now centered and the function is better because it is aesthetics, but it's so much more than aesthetics. The, the way that her jaw now functions is a huge improvement. And yes, it's great that her teeth look so much better and her smile looks so much better, but even if we just got that functional improvement, that is a huge win. So to me, this is a fabulous case for so many reasons. Um, and then some things that were unexpected for me, like the extrusion of the upper laterals instead of the intrusion of the centrals. But start to finish, going back to where we had these, you know, some doctor had placed these big bulky, um, composite veneers on those centrals to try to bring them out so they weren't so, weren't so far back and to get rid of that and to make it the nice natural tooth structure again and get everything aligned, I just think is such a huge win. It looks so nice. I'm really, really thrilled for Dr. Galletly and for this patient and also Don for, I'm sure this was really gratifying to be able to see this kind of result as you mentored this, you know, Dr. Galletly with the limited experience that she's had. I mean, this is a difficult ortho case. And with your planning and your help with the diagnosis and Dr. Lala's help with the setups 
and then her executing it well and the patient executing it well. I mean, it must have been really gratifying for all of you guys to treat this case and see these kinds of results. So um, went a little long, guys. Um, I apologize that that went so long. I, there's just so much good stuff in this case. And uh, I wish we even had more time to talk about some of the other details that we kind of glossed over. But um, thank you, everybody who took the time out to be here or who are watching the recording after the fact and spending the time all the way to the end. Thank you, Don, for this case. And thank you, Lucy, for this case. Um, love to hear any other comments you guys have. If you want to type in the chat or ask any questions or unmute yourself, I'm happy to take some questions right now. Um, or maybe just, just discuss some things you saw here that you want to talk about some more. I think you did a great job. Uh, thanks, Don. Thanks, Sam. I appreciate that. You speak so clearly. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, Dr. Mason, yeah, any other comments, Don? What would you like to add? Next one I'm doing, it's October 6th. I think it's a Friday at about the same time. And it's on mixed dentition, so don't miss it. <laughs> that, should, that should be a very good one. Really, yeah. really good. Basics of mixed dentition with uh, with a progressive aligner. So I'm going to go through with you some of the things that uh, you may want to consider. And unless you like doing TPAs, headgears, and utility arches and advancing arches, I don't know. If you like doing those, that's okay, too. <laughs> hey Don, maybe you can comment just real quick for those who are still on. Um, what are your thoughts if you were going back and treating this case again and you had the option to do a fixed appliance or do what you did here with this um aligner or maybe even a hybrid case, how would you have approached this differently if you had the option to use whatever you wanted? I think I think that the aligners on the functional appliance cases are coming out better than on the fixed case, we were we were bonded composite to the lower molars, you know, to to break the occlusion and you know get that happening. Uh, but the aligners like separate things so well that I don't know. I think if you lined them up, you'd probably you could use either. But uh, if you lined them up side by side, case by case, and I've done a lot of them now. Um, I, I like the aligners with the functional shift cases. Yeah, it'd be interesting if you, I mean, if you had unlimited time and unlimited patience of our patient, um, it'd be interesting to combo it up and at the end actually go, you know, because that functional shift got corrected within the first 12 months. Yeah, and and the thing is, is that when you see the shift, you're really checking whether or not the teeth are going to fit when you do twist that mandible, are the teeth going to fit? And so I don't, I don't know if we quite have that much control on the, on you know, on the fixed appliance. But like on this one, you might put lingual root torque on that upper upper canine. But you got to be pretty smart to find that, yeah. you know. So I don't know. I kind of like the aligners on these functional shift cases. Absolutely, because you you got to see where it was going to go, and then put the teeth where it would accept that shift. And with the braces, you're just you're just hoping and you're projecting that it will go that way, and you're kind of trying to line everything up so that it will. But it's oh, nice. Well, it, yeah, if there's anything in the way that is going to prevent the jaw from shifting over, you know, your elastic isn't working. Yeah. Yeah. And it'd be interesting at the end of that to have put in, you know, some brackets with some SLI on the front and see if you could actually get some lingual root torque on those upper anterior teeth. And you could do that, but you're not going to get the patient at that point. She's no, she's, no, no. Yeah, no. I'm just, I'm just thinking I'm in my head. It's on her front too. <laughs> if I had unlimited patient patience and willingness, you know, but um, I think that aligner case was really, really fabulous, and um, the way you guys handled it and the way it all came out was really cool. There was a question here um, that says uh, the class two on the left side is due to the use of elastics. Um, so the left side, the, the correction came from correct diagnosis in understanding that there was a functional shift of the mandible and then setting up the aligner case so that the teeth were moved in a way that they got out of the way of that 
shift being corrected. And so it was, yes, the class two elastics helped the jaw to shift. So did the cross arch elastic in the front, but those wouldn't have worked if the teeth were not moved by the aligners into a position that would allow that shift to happen. So it's not just the fact that class two elastics were used. It was the fact that the class two is elastic was used on the left side with a cross arch elastic with a proper diagnosis and a proper setup so that the teeth were moving to allow and actually encourage that shift to happen. Okay. I've so had, um, lately that in the first series, I said no elastics because when you look and you said, well, when is the case ready for the elastics? It wasn't ready until, you know, you know, near the end. So I said, no, no, just no elastics in the first, first series. Then we'll see where the jaw shifts and it may just shift by you, inter you know, get rid of the interferences, the elastics just encourage the jaw to kind of be moved along. And, uh, and I think it's okay to wait until the first revision to do that. Yeah. Well, the honest truth is, is you and I would both anticipate that if we did nothing more than just throw in a, a flat plane splint, that the patient, when, once we eliminate all the problems, the patient's mandible on its own would go back into the centered position. What? So if, if we can put the aligners in the mouth, which act kind of like a splint, and then in the aligners, move the teeth into the right position, even without the elastics, we should expect the same thing, that the mandible would want to go back into that properly aligned position. And like you said, the elastics would just be to try to encourage it and, and make sure it happens, but it actually could happen without the elastics. I mean, the class two left out at the finish. Um, yeah, my guess at the finish, there's a little, let me, let me share it again. Here's our finish. And there's still a little bit of class two left on that left side. And um, again, when you finally get to the point where you're really not changing much, you're not adding a lot of class two elastics, you're always going to see a little bit of relapse. People do relapse even when they've had like a, a functional shift that we've encouraged one direction. They might come in at one point where because we've had elastics, they're kind of in, in a certain position. But then as we stop those forces, they'll relapse back a little bit. So um because at one point we showed some pictures where it looked like we were solid class one on the left. And now in the final, there's a little bit of class two left. And I'm just going to guess that that was a little bit of, um, of basically relapse as we wore these finishing aligners with no class two elastics at that point. Okay, guys, I'm going to go ahead and end. It's been long. I appreciate you guys all being here um, and uh, look forward to the next one with you. So Feel free to reach out. Um, if you have any questions or comments you want to make, uh, I'll just type my email in here for everybody real quick. Collins at posortho.com. Oh, there that, that is. If anybody wants to follow up with any questions or you need help starting a liner case or something, give me a shout. So thank you for spending time. Appreciate y'all being here and I will see you next time.